Thank you for joining us today. I'm Russ Altman. I'm a professor of bioengineering at Stanford and an associate director of the Stanford Human-Centered AI Institute. I'll be your moderator along with my colleague, Rob Reich, professor of political science and also an associate director at what we call HAI, H-A-I. This is our second online COVID conference. You may know that the first one was on April 1st, very shortly after the shelter in place orders were issued. We focused then on the urgent needs to understand this new pandemic. More than 32,000 people joined us on April 1st. And in four sessions, we discussed an overview of understanding the disease, its spread, different approaches to mitigation, and which countries were handling things particularly well, and which ones were having some issues. We discussed the infodemic of misinformation and disinformation happening alongside the pandemic, the rise of xenophobia and the biosecurity concerns associated with the pa pandemic. We also heard from scientists who are tracking the spread of the disease and creating new tools to estimate unreported infections and their impact. And then of course, we learned how AI is being used to identify possible treatments and vaccine candidates. These sessions were all posted on the HIGH YouTube channel, where you'll find recording, uh, recordings of today's conference as well in a couple of days. So what are we talking about today? Today, we're looking beyond the immediate crisis of flattening the curve and organizing to confront the pandemic. It's clear that the world will be living with COVID-19 and its impacts for the foreseeable future. And we need to think about the different pathways out of the crisis, as well as the accompanying economic and social challenges that we will undoubtedly face. So now I want to pass it to my co-host, Rob, who um, would like to welcome you as well. Good morning, everybody, and greetings to anyone joining us from anywhere in the world. I want to pass the microphone in a moment to our co-director of the Institute for Human-Centered AI, John Nichimendi. But first, I think um, we feel obliged to offer a few words about the current state of life in the United States on this day, um, Monday, June 1st. This feels like one of the most difficult periods in history that we've ever faced as a nation. And it's as if the United States is experiencing a combination of the 1918 pandemic and the tumultuous and violent 1968 election year all at once. This is a time of incredible pain and anger for all Americans, regardless of our politics. And it's a particularly difficult time for black Americans. We feel divided as a human race and as citizens right now. We still have so far to go to achieve racial equality. Now, we believe there are important connections to be made between the pandemic and the protests that we see across the country against our history of racism. For example, will these mass protests trigger an uptick in infections? We also note the disproportionate effect of COVID-19 on racial minorities, especially African-Americans, and the disproportionate police violence against African-Americans. Also, what will it mean to run a safe and healthy election in the United States if there are pandemic-related shelter-in-place policies as well as widespread protests still ongoing over the course of the summer and into November? What effect might these protests have on mobilization, turnout, campaigning, and so on? We hope today to raise some of these issues with the distinguished guests who will join us as part of our conference. Now with that, let me introduce you to HAI's co-director, John Echemendi. Thank you, Russ and Rob, for all your work putting together today's conference. And thank you, Rob, for acknowledging the tragic events of the past several weeks, events that have affected us all so deeply. I'm here to represent both myself and Professor Fei-Fei Li, my esteemed co-director of Stanford High. High's mission is to advance AI research, education, policy, and practice to improve the human condition. We take this mission seriously. We believe that AI provides an extremely powerful tool for good if used properly, but equally for ill if not. Our goal is to promote the former and to minimize the latter. At the present moment, we find ourselves buffeted by extraordinary forces on multiple fronts, social, economic, political, and biological. We firmly believe that problems of this scale can only be addressed by bringing to bear expertise from across the disciplinary spectrum using the most powerful tools available. 
For this reason, we feel it is incumbent on high to assemble the appropriate expertise to advance our understanding of issues that confront us in the present health crisis and to provide thoughtful research-based discussion about the best, most promising approaches for emerging from that crisis. Today's speakers are academics and industry experts examining the economy, the healthcare industry, and society. We hope that you'll find their contributions valuable, informative, thought-provoking, and insightful. So thank you once again for joining us today. And Russ, back to you. Thank you very much, John. And before we begin, just a few logistics. Uh, as you can see, this is an entirely virtual meeting, so please bear with us if there are technical glitches during the time together. We apologize for the funny behavior of Zoom backgrounds that may take out parts of my head and others, and any sound issues. You will hear time checks for the speakers going out over the audio. Also, we may have to cut speakers who go long, and we apologize to them in advance. If our signal goes, if our signal goes down, please go to hai.stanford.edu for alternative ways to view the conference. Our conference is divided into three sessions with three speakers each. Each speaker will present for about eight minutes, and at the end of the session, we'll have a panel discussion. Importantly, we want to, you to be involved in this discussion. Please go to the COVID-19 conference page on our website and click on the Ask Questions link. We have a team of people reading the questions and feed them to our moderators, and we'll try to get to as many of these questions as we can. We'll, we'll aim to take brief breaks between the sessions, and we will try our best to stay on schedule. I wanna say that although this is about AI, artificial intelligence and COVID, we have been very broad and expansive in putting together the agenda. We wanna make sure that this is important and relevant, and we have not um, looked for strict boundaries between AI and the other adjacent disciplines. With that, let's begin our first session. Rob, can you take it away? Thanks very much, Russ. We're gonna start our first session today with the economic picture. How do we emerge from this health pandemic and what's the future of work in the wake of it? Our first presenter is Abigail Wozniak. Abigail is an economist and the director of an Opportunity and Inclusive, Inclusive Growth Institute at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And she's also a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a fellow at the Institute for the Study of Labor in Bonn, Germany. Abigail, please turn on your mic and share your screen and you're ready to go. Thank you so much, Rob, and also for your opening words, which I thought were really fitting um, and help us understand where we are today. So I want to spend the time that I have doing two things um, and, and a half thing, which is uh, step zero to remind you of the disclaimer at the bottom of your screen. I'm speaking for myself as a researcher and not for the Federal Reserve System. So that's my half thing out of the way. The two things I want to do today um, are to share with you information about a study called the COVID Impact Survey, which is ongoing, um, so that you understand what this contains and can make use of these data if they could be helpful to you. And then I'm gonna, uh, the second thing I'll be doing is explaining what the COVID Impact Survey can tell us about how employer screening might function in a widespread way if that gets adopted over the ongoing course of the pandemic. The COVID Impact Survey is a project that I've been a co-PI on for the last two months at this point. We designed the survey early on in the pandemic in order to provide a broad spectrum view to policymakers of what is happening on the ground um, in their jurisdictions. And the aspirations of the COVID Impact Survey are really twofold. The first is to provide, as I mentioned, a broad spectrum view on what is happening to respondents. And to that end, the COVID Impact Survey has three modules to it. Um, a module surveying on physical health and COVID symptoms, a module on mental and social health, and a module on economic and financial security. That third module looks the most like what um, economists like myself typically survey on. But in developing the COVID impact survey, we felt it was important to have a handle on those other two components as well, to really give us a full picture of who is being impacted by this virus, both directly and indirectly. What is their health status and their daily experience of the restrictions um, and the health impacts that they might be seeing? 
And then what are the other impacts that they're experiencing in a broad range of areas that contribute to overall well-being? We are grateful for a considerable amount of external support. So this has really been um, a multi-entity effort. And it has helped us to achieve really the second goal of the COVID impact survey, which is to bring that broad lens to geographically and other um, community level specific entities. So we really need to have enough information in this survey and contact enough people in order to be able to provide a picture of what is happening um, at a local level, because that is the decision, the level at which these kind of opening and closing decisions are made. So we've been able, at least in a prototype format, to achieve that for 10 states and eight cities. Um, you can see those listed at the bottom of your screen. We also are able to do this for uh, various uh, populations divided on race, ethnic, and other identity lines um, for folks throughout the US. So we really wanna have that lens on communities not just a picture of the nation as a whole. The communities can be defined geographically or by other population characteristics. We hope to make a number of contributions with this survey. I won't be able to tell you about all of them today. I'm gonna to be focusing on that second one, which really involves the intersection of some of these survey areas and how they fit into what the workplace might look like going forward through the remainder of the pandemic. So now I'm gonna focus on some components of the COVID impact survey that let me approximate what a widespread screening policy might look like were we to adopt that as we go forward in the pandemic. I'm going to be telling you a bit about um, what screening in particular on fever symptoms looks like in these data. You can see from the list in front of you that I'm actually able to approximate in the COVID impact survey um, two different types of screenings that employers might adopt widely. The first is temperature screening with thermometers. So about half of our sample is able to take their own temperature and report that. So I can approximate what that might look like if employers were to screen at the door of their businesses. Then we have many questions on self-reported symptoms. And so that lets me approximate a couple of different types of screening apps that might be deployed by companies or other types of entities in which individuals self-report the symptoms that they're experiencing. I'm going to be focusing on self-reported temperature screens. So these are short items, little mini surveys within the survey that ask folks if they've been experiencing any fever temperatures in the last several days. I have highlighted in orange the ones I'm going to be showing you just a little bit about. There's an ability in the COVID impact survey to screen on other types of um, symptoms that you might want to use, like COVID symptoms themselves. So what I wanna show you is two things about how these screens I think are going to shake out. The first is um, to draw your attention to really the far right column here. This is just the average share of respondents in our survey who are in the labor force. So I've respond, um, restricted this to folks who are already potentially going to work. The share of them who would be flagged by these various screens that I can approximate in the COVID impact survey. And the ones I highlighted in orange, again, are those temperature screens. You can see that if we're screening on temperature using a thermometer, and I set this at a 99 degree threshold, we are potentially going to screen out on a daily basis about 4% of the workforce. That's very similar to a self-reported to um, item scale with those three measures of fever symptoms. If you report two or more of those, um, you would screen out about 3% of the workforce. If we go to any fever symptoms, the number goes up dramatically to 12% of the workforce reporting a fever symptom at a point in time. I'm gonna put in a box and put it to the side, the question of how workers are going to respond to these. I'm gonna come back to that in the policy conversation in a minute and happy to talk about that in the Q&A. But if employees respond to these self-reported checks or these temperature screens the way they do on our survey, we are talking about potentially screening out large numbers of folks um, on a daily basis. That's not to say it's inappropriate, it's to say we need to be prepared for that type of a reality if we are going to try to keep workers safe and contain the spread of this disease. The second thing I want you to take away about these screens is that they don't actually all pick up the same workers. So what I'm showing you here is just a table of correlations between these various different measures that I can put together in the COVID impact survey. And what you can see is that by and large, the correlations are far below one. Um, and in the cases where they seem to get closer to one, it's usually because one set of symptoms is a subset of another set on a longer index. 
So potentially the type of screen and the precise screen that employers adopt is going to be important for who they screen out. So I wanna tell you um, just the takeaways from this very early analysis on these questions in the COVID impact survey. I think we're looking at potentially screening out uh, what to me are not small numbers of workers on a daily basis. At a minimum, three to 4% of folks will need to stay home and see how their symptoms evolve. Uh, it will matter which screen you use. And I have preliminary evidence that we're still working on that it doesn't look like workers are already doing um, this kind of self-quarantine themselves. So I don't see strong evidence that workers with these mild symptoms that they report are already staying home themselves to see how symptoms evolve. So I think that One suggests minute. importance for um, policy that's going to support this. So I wanna conclude with uh, what I think are really important policy takeaways from the, um, the statistics that we've been able to uh, pull out so far on this question. First, we're going to need adequate support to encourage those who have symptoms to stay home. We already have some of these um, protections in place under CARES, but they need to be clear to people, they need to be enforced, and they need to be extended. Um, it needs to be clear that this includes those in affected households. Um, and this support is so important because this is what's going to guarantee the truth in those screenings. If going to work and getting your paycheck is contingent on how you answer a workplace symptom screen, potentially um, there will not be full transparency and truth in reporting on the part of employees. So those protections have to be in place to guarantee um, honest response to that. We also need incentives for individuals to get tested. Employers might decide to do this themselves directly, but potentially they could incentivize workers to use public testing um, and we might even think of programs that provide those incentives directly from the government to citizens to encourage folks who are having some symptoms to really get tested. And then finally, I didn't get to talk about this, but um, we have this information in the COVID impact survey. Folks who already have underlying um, risk factors that would make their COVID infection more serious potentially need to be supported to um, be away from the workforce for the course of the pandemic that doesn't currently exist not currently necessarily withdrawing from the workforce on their own. And so thinking about how to support those folks, keep them from developing the worst cases is important as well. I'll just conclude with the line that I, I think is important from this survey. There's always a lot of worry about the asymptomatic folks who are spreading this disease um, unbeknownst to others. But what I think the COVID impact survey is telling us is that we need to pay a lot of attention to the symptomatics and use the information that they have um, to design policy and help themselves select and keep folks safe by making good decisions themselves. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Abigail. As you can see, um, starting the economy is not just a matter of flipping a switch and returning to work. There are important challenges to face in uh, reactivating the workforce and different companies, places of labor while still containing the virus. Um, I'd like now to introduce our second speaker, Lisa Kahn. Lisa is a professor of economics at the University of Rochester and her research focuses on labor economics. Her most recent work asks whether the Great Recession accelerated technological change and exacerbated polarization in the United States. Lisa, you can take it away now and please share your video and turn your microphone on. Okay, um, hi. Uh, Thank you very much for, for including me. Uh, and again, thank you for the, for the words at the beginning. I think it's very important to keep in mind the national situation beyond just the COVID crisis. Um, but what I wanna to talk to you about today is some ongoing work uh, that I'm drawing from a joint with Eliza Forsyth, Fabian Langa and David Wixer. And we're interested in understanding how the labor market has evolved during the time of COVID. Now, of course, we all know there has been this uh, broad-based collapse. So for example, the red line is showing you the trend in 2020 by week uh, for initial unemployment insurance claims where we see this massive spike uh, starting in the beginning of March. And by now, new unemployment insurance claims have, have totaled uh, 40 million people. And so we know that there's been this unprecedented nationwide collapse in the economy. But what we don't know is a lot of detail around that. And so today, what I'm going to talk about is some analysis that we've been doing um, with job vacancy postings collected by a company called Burning Glass Technologies. And what Burning Glass Technologies does is it uses uh, machine learning and a range of uh, AI techniques as well to scrape jobs 
ads that are posted to online sources. So for example, monster.com, careerbuilder.com, individual employer websites, and they code up a range of detail about, about these jobs. Uh, and the breadth of sites that they scrape, over 40,000 different sites, leads them to believe they have data on the near universe of jobs that are posted to an online source. And so importantly, this gives us um, a great deal of detail about labor demand. And it's worth noting that job vacancy postings are inherently a forward-looking measure. So they can tell us how employers foresee um, the need to contract when the COVID crisis hit and how employers are thinking about the need to hire as the COVID crisis, crisis alleviates. And the other useful thing about the burning glass data is that, is that they've been around for a while now, so they've been validated. So um, Rob mentioned some early work that I did on burning glass data, trying to understand how, and showing actually that in the Great Recession, firms accelerated the adoption of technologies that could replace certain swaths of their workforce. And that showed up in the burning glass data by firms all of a sudden after the Great Recession, asking for people who had computer skills and analytical skills and that combined with other data sources on capital inputs and declines in employment suggests that indeed employers took the opportunity of the Great Recession to restructure. And I think Eric is gonna talk about what that means for the COVID crisis next. But what we learn from the burning glass data for the current COVID crisis, you can see the blue line is showing you the trend in vacancy postings that saw a 40% collapse over the same time period as UI claims spiked. Um, and potentially a little bit of a recovery going. These data go up to the minute, um, they go up to Saturday. I was working on incorporating them this morning. So they are a real-time measure. And importantly, they give us a great deal of detail about the economy. So one question that we're particularly interested in is how did state shutdown policies and state stay-at-home orders impact the economy? Well, one way to understand that is in this graph, we're showing you the time series for different groups of states. The solid darkest line is showing you the states that issued stay-at-home orders the earliest, that's California, New York, Washington, and some others. The dashed light line is showing you states that never had a statewide stay-at-home policy, and the other lines are, are time somewhere in between. Now, the first order fact from this figure is a broad-based collapse across all state groups that was roughly aligned to a synchronous, roughly at the same time period. There are some small differences, such, for example, the states that closed the earliest, they do look like they had a steeper collapse, and the states that didn't close at all, they look like they had a shallower collapse. But the broad picture here is that job vacancies collapsed across the board regardless of the timing of state stay-at-home policies and whether they have these policies. We can also look across industries. And so this graph is showing you as a ratio relative to the beginning of the year, what the number of postings looks like for different types of industries. The blue solid line is representing essential retail. So that's your grocery stores uh, and, and, and gas stations and things like that. This group actually saw no decline in vacancy postings. In fact, they have these big spikes, which likely represent employers scrambling to get workers to sell you your toilet paper and your food and your needs um, over the crisis. Uh, but this group is largely distinct. Another group that didn't take as big a hit uh, was, was the nursing occupation. So, but besides these frontline jobs, every other sector took a hit. This graph shows you um, uh, some customer facing sectors that took among the biggest hits. So the blue dash line are non-essential retail, things like your clothing stores. The red line are, are restaurants and hotels. And the orange line is personal care, for example, your barbers and your tattoo parlors. Um, and these all customer facing roles took the biggest hit, even though, for instance, um, food and accommodation are, are generally essential industries. The green lines are also showing you other, other groups. So other essential industries, the solid green line, and other non-essential industries, the dash green line. And these had a fairly similar experience. So in terms of a uh, collapse. So what have we learned so far? Um, job vacancy posting saw a broad-based collapse that was similar to the most part to a first order approximation across states that had these stay-at-home policies early versus late versus not at all. What I didn't show you is that we also see a broad-based collapse across occupations 
whether or not that occupation is deemed to be able to work from home. So regardless of work conditions, whether you're capable of leaving your house to, to, to work or whether you can do your work at home, we saw a big collapse. And then the previous figure showed you, we saw a big collapse across essential and non-essential industries. While frontline jobs such as retail, essential retail and nursing were somewhat protected, customer facing jobs such as non-essential retail and personal care took the biggest hit, but all sectors for the most part took a big hit. And this suggests to us that the damage to the economy is not solely caused by the stay at home orders. Uh, it's just too broad based. And so therefore it's unlikely to be undone simply by lifting these stay at home orders. And so the last thing that I'm gonna show you is an early look at what's been happening since the economy has been opening. So here you see uh, vacancy postings by three state groups. The dash line are again, the states that never closed. The um, uh, dark line are states that opened by May 16th. And the lighter line are states that either have not opened yet or have only opened most recently. And here for the most part, again, we see a very similar trend across all state groups with maybe a slight rebound uh, for, the, for the earliest states. One minute. Thanks. And then what I, we can also do is break this down into a cup, some of those uh, hardest hit sectors, the non-essential retail in the top left, restaurants in the top right, personal care in the bottom left, other non-essential jobs in the bottom right. For the most part, we do see some interesting rebounds overall here. So non-essential retail has made quite a rebound in recent weeks and as have restaurants. And these rebounds are really fairly similar across state groups and, you, and you'd have to squint quite a bit to see a difference. And this may be a little too small for you to squint, but trust me, uh, there's really not been that much of a difference yet, even though there has been some rebound. So what does this all mean? Yes, we are seeing a little bit of a rebound, especially in non-essential retail, which took one of the biggest hits. And that, by the way, suggests we're going to be seeing extraordinary worker reallocation in the labor market going forward because non-essential retail actually did have among the biggest layoffs at the beginning of the crisis. And now they're doing a lot of the rebound in hiring. Um, but the early evidence on reopenings confirms uh, that our earlier inclination that you can't just flip a switch to the, get the economy back on track because it wasn't that switch of stay at home orders that caused the shortfall in the first place. Recovery is going to take basically an increase in aggregate demand that needs to come from getting the virus under control and improvements in consumer confidence and sentiment so that they think they can afford to spend money on goods and other aspects like restoration of, of supply chains uh, and things like that. And moving forward, that's what uh, we intend to track. And we're also very interested in moving forward in how these response and vacancy postings interacts with what we've also seen is an unprecedented, dec unprecedented decline in worker search effort at the same time as there's more workers unemployed than ever. And historically, those things usually track each other. So it's very interesting that they haven't. Um, but these data allow us um, a detailed picture in real time that we will continue to hopefully track uh, the, the COVID crisis. So, thank you. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, well, once again, another presentation that underscores that restarting the economy is not, the, not a matter of flipping a switch um, simply lifting shelter in place orders that there are just many complicated issues to work through in order to rebuild consumer confidence and social trust in the safety of the workplace. Um, we're going to wrap up our economic session with a presentation from Eric Vinyolfsson. Uh, Eric is a senior fellow at HAI and he's going to join us um, here at Stanford in a full-time capacity this summer. Um, for these uh, remaining months until then, he's currently on the faculty at MIT, where he directs the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy, and his work focuses on the effects of information technologies on business strategy, productivity, and performance. Eric, uh, you can go ahead and share your screen, um, turn on your microphone, and start your presentation. Thanks, Rob and, and Russ. Thank you so much for organizing this. I'm, I'm very excited to be coming to Stanford exactly because of the kinds of events like this that you've organized and, and the privilege to uh, be able to, to share the discussion with Abby and Lisa. And, and I'm very much looking forward also to uh, all the participants and the questions and comments uh, people may have. As you noted, uh, you know, we're in the midst of an of a unprecedented tragedy, both in health and the economy. Um, and we've heard some of the, the effects of that already. 
I'm going to talk a little bit more about what might come after that. Um, economists have a term called hysteresis, which basically means that sometimes when you change things, they don't go back to the way they were before, uh, even when the conditions return. And I think that's going to be very much the case with, with this crisis. Um, people like us are learning about the power of remote work. Uh, companies are aggressively trying to figure out how to automate some of their operations, how to use machine learning and other technologies to have people uh, have the workplace place continue to function with fewer human workers. And uh, some of those changes I think are going to be permanent and lasting. So that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Let me, um, let me share my slides here and show you what I have in mind. So um, I'll talk in particular about those two topics that I just mentioned, um, how COVID is affecting AI machine learning and also remote work. And, and let me start with a, a, a quote that I came across from a, a, a revolutionary uh, uh, about a century ago. He said that there are decades where nothing happens and then there are weeks when decades happen. And I think these past few weeks are, are example of those kinds of uh, uh, time periods. There's been just a, a huge acceleration in obviously remote work and also machine learning and, and, and over the weekend, maybe some social change as well. Um, to, to zoom in first on some of what's happened with technology, uh, we've seen a huge increase in the adoption of different technologies. Lisa touched on this a little bit as well as how these crises can accelerate technology adoption. One example is TensorFlow, the tool that is Google developed for um, doing machine learning has become dramatically more popular, 10 million downloads just in the past month. Um, and a little later, I'll show you some of the work that we've been doing using that exact tool. Um, but at the same time, machine learning is very far from artificial general intelligence. It can't do everything. There are just some things that it does very well and some things not so well. So a natural question is what parts of the economy are gonna be most affected by the adoption of these technologies about machine learning in particular, and which parts will be relatively less affected. And working with uh, Tom Mitchell, Daniel Rock, and others, we've written a series of papers to try to identify the set of tasks that are most suitable for machine learning. And you can read more detail about them in the papers, but let me briefly say that what we've done is we've applied this rubric to 950 occupations or 18,000 occupation-specific tasks to understand which ones are more suitable and which ones are less suitable. And uh, there's some patterns that emerge. Uh, for instance, we can see that if you look at all the occupations and you array them on the horizontal axis here by what the average wage is in that occupation from the lowest paid ones on the left to the higher paid ones on the right, um, you see a pattern where the more machine learning applications are available in the lower paid app uh, jobs on average and less so in the higher paid jobs. So, so for instance, most of us have probably experienced the uh, automated cashiers that can recognize a, a cucumber or a banana or a tomato um, much better than they could have a few years ago and beginning to automate parts of that process. But there's some high paid jobs uh, like airline pilot that are also being increasingly affected by these technologies. Uh, no, no occupation is immune. Um, even economists are on the list there, although a little less subject than, than uh, some of the other occupations according to the analysis. You can also group it by industry. And you see that, again, some industries are much more affected than others. Education services, not as much, but manufacturing, retailing, transportation, especially accommodation and food services have a lot of tasks that are suitable for machine learning. Um, different areas of the country are going to be affected very differently. Um, the kinds of work that people do in, in Wyoming are very different than what they do in Manhattan um, or Miami. And we see that shows up in our analysis as well, that the likelihood that a machine learning system can affect some of those tasks is higher in some parts of the country than other parts of the country. So we'll have some disparate impacts. And then we can zoom in on individual companies. We can use the same tool um, to look at the tasks that are done in individual companies. And here's one bank that we looked at in some depth. And uh, they have a lot of uh, occupations that are affected by machine learning. Uh, the ones near the bottom there, like teller, executive assistant, and personal banker, have a large percentage of their tasks that are suitable for machine learning. The red bar is pretty large. And uh, that means that these activities are likely to change quite a bit over the coming years, even more recently as, as companies are adopting these technologies. Um, and our tool also gives them a way to have a path 
for what to do next. One option, for instance, for personal bankers is to reinvent the job so that it has more of the skills that aren't subject to machine learning, like leadership, product development, customer relations, and less of the uh, tasks that are, are highly related to machine learning, like credit authorization. So it'd still be a personal banker, but they do very different work. Another option is to uh, find new roles. Um, some of these personal bankers have a lot of skill overlap with uh, business analysts or mortgage loan officers or HR managers, and we can map how similar they are to some of these other nearby occupations. And with a little bit of training, they're in a position to be much less vulnerable to uh, the machine learning revolution. Let me also say a few words about um, remote work. We just finished uh, two papers. Here's one of them, um, looking at the US data on how COVID is affecting uh, remote work and work from home. We looked at about 25,000 uh, uh, individuals and had them answer uh, two waves of surveys. And um, what we found was that about half of Americans are now working from home. It's an enormous transition. Um, before COVID, about one sixth were working at home and another third switched to working at home. So that's a big percentage of the workforce. I'm one of those people and I'm sure many of you are as well. After the pandemic, many of them will go back to working the way they were before, but many others are gonna continue to work from home. I talked to one CEO and uh, he pulled his workforce and they were mostly pretty happy with working at home. And he was very happy with the results and the productivity so he is in the process of renegotiating his leases and plans on having people one, minute. one to two days per week going forward and the rest of the time working at home. And when they do come in, they'll focus much more on interactive activities rather than working in separate offices and cubicles. And I think that's part of this hysteresis I mentioned over earlier, a transition that won't lead to us going back to the old ways afterwards. There are, as you might expect, big differences across states. Uh, the states in the Northeast that were hit hardest by COVID are also the ones that had the biggest switch to working at home. But we also found that one of the good predictors was the share of management and information work activities. Uh, those types of tasks are much easier to do working at home. And finally, uh, Lisa mentioned this uh, data set from Burning Glass Technologies has over 200 million online job postings. Uh, we were analyzing it last night using TensorFlow and we had some, some new results just in time for this. Uh, by looking at it, we could see which kinds of tasks and jobs are most suitable for machine learning. I'm sorry, most suitable for remote work. So similar to the other one, but now focusing on remote work instead. And you see that jobs like ours in education um, are tend to be uh, more remotable, anything involving management, whereas people doing installation and physical work are less remotable. So let me just summarize by saying that these powerful technologies are already available, whether in machine learning or remote work. They haven't been put to use as much because it takes time for businesses to adapt. But with this shock to the system, companies and individuals are being forced to adapt and learning when they work and when they don't work so well. Um, but thinking ahead, after the pandemic, we're going to have a new economy that has a lot more people doing remote work, a lot more people working offshore as well, and also a lot more people using machine learning in their work. And that's going to be a very different kind of economy. And it makes sense for managers today to think about what kind of skills and workforce they want for that economy of the future. So let me stop there and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Terrific. Um, all right, thanks very much, Eric. So at this point, I'd like to ask all three speakers to turn on their microphones and um, their video and uh, ask Russ uh, to join me as well. And we'll have a short discussion and then get to some questions from the audience in just a few minutes. So a general question for all of you, and we can hop in as you wish. Um, uh, we heard lots of really interesting data, um, some projections about the economic impact, both of just immediate return to the workforce as well as trends downstream and whatever, whatever the return works, works itself out. I'm curious to know a bit more about the disparate impact um, across different either kinds of labor or in particular by race and gender um, that you foresee. So Eric, for example, um, you noted that there's a disproportionate impact of low wage uh, on low wage jobs and some regional differences as well. Um, Abby, I'm interested in whether or not you see anything similar happening with respect to um, um, the, the, the kind of temperature testing regimes that are gonna be necessary to bring people back um, and Lisa, same for you with respect to um, the kinds of 
the kinds of questions about um, how it is that job vacancies are likely to tick up or, or, or remain flat. Uh, so um, insofar as you have information or guesses even on the basis of the data you've seen on disparate impact on race and gender, can you speak to that with respect to your different presentations? And um, Abby, if you wanna start first, just because you went first, please go ahead. Sure, I'm happy to start. So I will just underscore that, um, you know, as, as I think was clear from our motivation in, in starting the COVID impact survey, looking for disparate impacts was a was a major motivation as well. And we wanted to be able to look at those by geography. We also wanted to be able to look at those by um, demographics and other affiliations. I think that what we found there is potentially not terribly surprising, but it is quite concerning. So um, consistent with some different approaches, we do find more significant negative impacts on economic security for non-white individuals. Um, we find particularly large declines in employment and hours for Hispanic respondents, um, also to some extent for Asians. At the time of our data collection, we were finding um, nationally that black workers and white workers had experienced about similar declines. I'm not sure that is going to hold as the pandemic goes on. We are gonna be watching that closely. Um, and families with children have been experiencing steeper employment declines as well. And again, um, this extends to a number of the other well-being indicators that we can also track. So, um, so that's concerning. This is a, a widespread cut to well-being that is not being evenly shared. Everyone is experiencing negative changes, um, but folks who are older and folks who are higher earning to begin with um, are much more insulated. We also do see differences in these impacts across space. Um, like Lisa found, these are not well explained by the policies that places have adopted. They're also not well explained by the behaviors that people have adopted. So our survey asks folks what they themselves are doing, you know, none of which are really currently required. Um, at least again, at the time of the survey, everybody was adopting lots of different behaviors from what they had in the past. And that did not differ significantly across space. So it doesn't account for these different impacts. Um, I think what's happening is that some places are going to experience bigger negative changes. It's because of the populations that live there, and that suggests it's important for policy to target families and households that we know are the hardest hit. As far as disparities in how screening will work, um, that's something that I'm looking into as well. The temperature screens that I'm able to approximate do not seem to be differentially uh, flagging individuals on observable demographics, except possibly women um, are flagged more often for a temperature screen. That may be something that um, is a regularity. We need to look into that more. When you think about the other measures though, um, like self-reported headache, self-reported fatigue or cough, those do pick up um, individuals who are non-white in background or have other demographic differences more often that may be due to other underlying health conditions. And so we need to understand more about whether some of these self-reported symptom checkers might um, pick up different types of folks differentially and whether that's accurate. Let me ask one quick follow-up question on that, Abby. I think you mentioned in your presentation that on these self-reports on the temperature screens, um, as a kind of precondition for actually returning to the, to the workforce. Um, there's a, a problem of incentives. If you don't have your wage guaranteed, um, there's a, you know, a, a misaligned incentive for honest reporting. So what do we know, if anything, about um, the incidence of wage guarantees if you report that you have a temperature and therefore shouldn't report to the workforce and, and disparate impact in that respect? So the CARES Act right now is designed to guarantee paid leave for individuals who believe that they may have COVID in order to take time off to get that investigated. Um, it is also designed to provide paid leave for folks who are caring for someone with COVID. So in that sense, it would expand to the household. In my view, this needs to be really clear and really strong because I don't see a lot of evidence in the data that folks are staying home if they are ill. Um, and the kind of flip side is when folks report more symptoms, they report separating from their employer. So it's unclear why they are doing that, but the intention of the CARES Act is for them to remain with their employer but stay home. And 
I'm not, that's not what I'm seeing really in the data yet. So something is maybe not getting communicated. Now, there are other policy pieces that could be interacting with this. The UI top up might affect employer and employee behavior in this context that might go away. Um, but I think that we're not seeing this piece of the act work the way we think it should be working just yet. And so that we need to kind of track that. Um, I kind of am of the opinion that it is going to require a little bit more of a carrot even than the CARES Act has. Um, I think people need to be incentivized to watch this carefully. Um, you know, I'll say even myself, I, I kind of get halfway out the door to go to something and then I think, oh no, do I have a sore throat? You know, and maybe I should pay attention to that because my instinct is to not pay attention to that. It's to kind of barrel ahead until I feel good and sick. And, um, and I'm sure a lot of people are the same way. So I think, you know, beyond guaranteeing paid leave, we need to actually incentivize folks to carefully monitor themselves and, and look for that information. Should I be quarantining? Should I take a day off just to be careful and see what happens? And that's a piece that is not in the policy right now. Right. We'll be talking in the next session about some different testing and tracing um, policy regimes, but let me um, um, invite Lisa and Eric into the conversation about disparate impact uh, in any respect. Um, Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, sure. I'll just say a couple of things. I think Abby covered a, a lot of that. Um, the uh, a couple of things. So one is that the frontline workers, the workers whose whose health is is most at risk, uh, research shows that the, they're more likely to be minorities. Um, and some of the jobs that we think of, like nursing and cashiers, are are more likely to be female. So there's certainly going to be a disparate impact on on the health effects there, and on the economic effects. Um, although employers have contracted across the board whether or not they're posting for a job that typically somebody can perform at home or somebody needs to be in person, that's been contracted across the board. But from the data that we do have, it looks like layoffs have spiked higher in jobs that can't be performed from home. And I think Eric can speak to this, but that's more likely, or sorry, yes, that can't be performed at home. And so that's more likely to be, the layoffs are more likely to be for the less educated and so already the ones in the, in the worst position. And so combining that layoff spike with what we're seeing on the job vacancy side means they're gonna, the lower income people who already are suffering more, they're gonna have to last for this longer period in unemployment. Um, and so there's probably gonna be a disparate impact there as well. Yeah, so I mean, I'm just summarizing here in my own head and listening to you all, uh, commonplace is to say that the pandemic has revealed a whole bunch of background inequality in American society, but it also sounds like it's going to exacerbate um, um, these inequalities on a number of dimensions as well. Uh, Eric, over, over to you. Yeah, well, first let me say it, it could exacerbate them, but I don't think there's any inevitability. And I think one of the reasons that you guys are organizing this is right. depending on the actions that we take, um, there's a lot of different possible futures that we can have. Uh, that said, to underscore what, what you said, the, the current effects um, we did see, just to, to, to reiterate both on what I, I briefly showed on both machine learning and remote work, on machine learning, there was a, a, a noticeable gradient um, between uh, higher paid versus lower paid jobs, uh, the, the lower paid jobs having more tasks that were suitable for machine uh, learning. Um, we also saw some significant geographic differences uh, as well. Um, and on remote work, um, I did it quickly, but the kinds of occupations and tasks that were affected were also quite different. Um, not surprisingly, information workers like all of us on this panel um, were less likely to be affected. And, and uh, if I have to confess, I think in some ways I've been more productive the past uh, couple of months um, at home. But for most people or for a lot of people, that's not been the case. Um, we saw that, that jobs that involve, you know, many jobs do involve physically interacting with, uh, with the things that they're working with and they just is they can't do that remotely. So they've been, uh, have a much higher likelihood of being unemployed in our survey and much less likely of working home. And the last thing I'll say is, is a little anecdotal, but it's a, it's a blind spot that I had. Um, Larry Katz, the editor of the Quarterly Journal of Economics tweeted a, a little while back that the submissions were way up to the top journal in, in economics, or one of the top journal. And, uh, and I commented, yeah, I found that I was more productive working at home as well. And this seems to you know, work pretty well. And I was quickly barraged by a bunch of people who had kids at home. And they said, actually, not so much. It's, it's actually not necessarily easier to work at home if you have kids at home. So it, it makes a big difference. Um, and, I, and the data suggests it's, it's early, but it suggests that women have been disproportionately affected by that as opposed to men. So there are, there are a number of things that are emerging now that, that um, 
I and I think others had some blind spots about, but the data are, are coming in. All right, well, we're gonna to move to audience questions in just a little bit, but uh, I wanna get my co-host Russ Altman into the conversation here. Yeah, thanks. These were great talks. And, and I have a couple of follow-ups. Uh, first for Eric on this issue of disparities. Uh, and I, by the way, I love that quote about decades and weeks and I can't reproduce it, but it's a great quote. Um, a lot has happened in a very short time. Uh, uh, we've been talking about this displacement and I, I've heard you speak about it and others speak about it for several years now. And I'm struck that uh, just as in that quote, there is now a pressure to retrain and to get the workforce moved in, with an urgency that is much greater. We knew it was coming and there was a lot of discussions about it, but now it's present. Uh, is there data or are there policy moves that we need to consider to take those people whose main skills are all in those red bars that you showed and have them begin yeah. uh, as quickly as possible to take up new types of work? What, what's the options there? Well, you know, I think it's a tragedy. There are literally trillions of dollars worth of, of, it, uh, of smart uh, human capital, to use that term, uh, going out the doors of companies. They're being laid off without a lot of attention to what's going to be needed on the other side of this. And some of it's being irreparably destroyed. Uh, business, small businesses that will never come back and, and, and careers that are going to be permanently changed. I wish people were paying more attention to what's on the other side of it, managers. They need a roadmap, and we're trying to provide that that says, look, um, the economy will come back. The pandemic won't continue forever. And on the other side of it, there's going to be a different kind of an economy. And it's one that I think all of us on, on this panel and probably most of the people listening have seen the outlines of already. You know, We know that machine learning and remote work, these technologies have been available. But the other thing we know from the history of, of technology adoption is that it's not enough to simply bolt technology onto an existing organization. There's a lot of reinvention that has to happen. There's a lot of new skills that need to be developed. Those things take time and most people don't invest the time. And it, that's why it often takes five, 10, even 20 years for these general purpose technologies to really change the way the economy works. But because of this crisis, a lot of that has been compressed and people like me are being forced to see that we can run our, our seminars. I've been running a, a lunch seminar every week um, online and it works <laughs> fabulously well. I don't know why I didn't do it before. Um, three times as many people are participating. The chat room makes it so it's much more egalitarian. Everyone can, can, can uh, chip in in a way they couldn't have before. And I, time after time, I've discovered that there are things, tools I already had that I could have been using, but I just didn't have the uh, push to make them happen. Um, I think that, that businesses are discovering that. And if they have a roadmap to the other side, they will be making the changes, not just for what they can do this week or this month, but where they want to be in the future. And in many cases, that's going to be uh, retraining people who are uh, able to do more of that information work, able to work remotely, able to work with machine learning technologies. So on the other side of it, we can have a, a better economy that, that's more productive and that hopefully also is more inclusive. Yeah, and you make a really important point that there might be a penny wise, pound foolish aspect to letting these people go because their okay. skills are not currently a precise match to what you need, because what you need is going to change. And these are, you know, devoted employees who understand the business and probably. Yeah, there, there's another quote I, I sometimes like to use, which, which is, uh, you know, you want to skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it is right now. And people need to have some visibility into what the economy, what the business is going to look like a, a year from now or two years from now and, and be preparing for that. And, and before, we, before we go to the crowd, yeah, if I could just right. ask Lisa, 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 one question. You said something very intriguing at the very end of your talk about um, there might be a little bit of a disharmony between the postings and the uptake of those postings. Uh, that is, I, and I interpreted that to mean that maybe people are not applying and filling these jobs as quickly. And I just wanted to ask about that because that's intriguing and would be very worrisome. Yeah, well, just actually that relates then to what I what I was going to say is that the the it, this discussion about bringing your workers back or training new workers or what are you going to do it really relates to to recalls and you know the vast majority of people who who have been put into unemployment say that they are waiting to be recalled by their employers. But if you look at our data that shows actually in the last recent weeks a somewhat of a rebound in in sectors like non essential retail, it doesn't really look it probably isn't the case that they're just recalling their old workers. They're probably taking a new draw. 
Um, and there are some jobs where they're going to be more likely to bring back their old workers because they have some firm specific human capital wrapped up in them or match quality really matters or something like that. And so that's another area where moving forward, we're going to have to see who's going to be struggling the most because their ties have been severed versus um, employers deciding, actually, no, I have a lot of value in those people. I want to bring them back. Um, but in terms of the sort of disconnect, one thing that we're kind of interested in is, of course, probably the reason why vacancies collapse so much is because firms are worried and they don't want to be hiring, they want to be contracting because they don't know what the future holds. But there's another piece of it, which is they know that nobody is going to be able to accept those jobs right now. They're, people aren't going to be searching for jobs if, if they're stuck at home because of a state policy or because of worry about the virus. And so what we've actually seen, and um, one of my co-authors, uh, co Eliza Forsyth, has been, has been showing a bunch of data on, for example, um, Google Trends in job search. And that is down dramatically, especially relative to the Great Recession, when you saw a lot of people sent to unemployment and then their, their job search spiked because they want a new job now that now they're not employed. And you don't see that right now. In fact, you see the opposite. And so that's a very interesting dynamic. And a small part of this vacancy collapse could actually be employers anticipating that nobody's going to be around to fill these vacancies right now. So I'll just sit tight. Super. Well, I want to move to a couple audience questions. We've had a few questions come in um, that concern uh, a, a different category of vulnerable worker. And um, this question is perhaps initially for Lisa, but I want to invite Abby or Eric to comment on it as well. So what kinds of support do you think will be necessary for the workers in industries, industries who were among the first to close and will almost certainly be the last to reopen? So think about amusement park workers or live music, live sports, um, a non-trivial part of the labor force, um, one that's quite visible to many people. Uh, and, um, you know, insofar as uh, the, the pandemic orders will not allow gatherings of more than 50 people or 100 people in, a, in an enclosed space in, in any imaginable future. Um, well, what do we do about that particular category of workers? Right. Well, I think that there are a couple of things. One is kind of, as Eric alluded to, the new, there's going to be a new normal and there's going to be while there's less demand for things like amusement parks and movie theaters, there's going to be more demand for some jobs and services. And what we're seeing is a great deal of reallocation where somebody who is taking ticket stubs at a movie theater can go and work at the grocery store. And they can make that switch pretty easily. And we saw that we have a big spike in demand for grocery store workers. So that type of movement is necessary. And that is only going to continue to be necessary going forward. And so that kind of reallocation can happen uh, in between some types of jobs, it's quite fluid. Between other types of jobs where there's a lot of specialized knowledge, it's, it's much less fluid. Like we're not, you can't just jump into nursing even though we need tons of nurses. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's quite a bit harder. Um, but the other thing is um, related to, to, to the stimulus packages is we need to find a way to support people who are, just waiting for their markets to come back and can't find these other positions. Because partly what I was saying is people are just scared to consume right now. And that's going to push us into a more long lasting recession than just the, just the COVID crisis would suggest. We're going to reopen the economy, but a lot of people won't have jobs and a lot of people's markets won't be coming back yet. And so they won't be spending the money so that employers are going to be wanting to contract more. And that can snowball into an aggregate demand recession. And so I think, I think that's a really big problem and it's an important point to raise. And I would just emphasize that the reallocation that's happening is important and to some extent can mitigate that, but then we need public policy to do the rest. Yeah, Eric. If I could, I just want to underscore that, you know, the, the transformation that's happening is not just within companies, it's across the economy and across sectors. And that's a healthy thing. I mean, we, we want the economy to, to transition. We should facilitate that. I was talking to, to Jeff Wilkie, head of Amazon Consumer Services a couple of weeks ago. He said they hired 125,000 people. So there is hiring happening in parts of the economy as we become more remote, not just in our work, but in our, in our consumption. Um, one of the issues is, can we get the skill mismatch? Can we, can we get people to learn the new skills that are needed for some of those jobs? Sometimes it may be very simple. Others, as Lisa mentioned, nursing and others, there's more sophisticated uh, teaching and training needs to be done. But it would be great if we had a national platform to help with this kind of matching, identify the opportunities, because there are people having trouble hiring right now. And sometimes it's because we don't have 
the right set of skills. And sometimes those skills can be taught relatively quickly. So if we had a more systematic way of saying, hey, you know, learn Python or learn customer service or learn something else, and there's a whole set of jobs that would be available for you. But if we do it right, um, actually on the other side of this, the economy is going to be more uh, uh, efficient, more nimble, more productive. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that could be, it's a tragedy that what's happened, but there is a, a silver lining if it leads to people finding better matches for their capabilities on the other side. I want to wrap up with a final question. It's a very big question with only about a minute or two to answer it. Uh, we, can't, we can't do real justice to it, but I think we have to put it on the table. That's a question about um, the global dimension rather than just a kind of domestic focus. And I have in mind at least two things. Um, in the language of economists or social scientists, we have a, you know, a great variety of natural experiments going on right now with respect to different policies that are confronting the pandemic, both in terms of public health and in terms of um, economic policy. Um, so I'm wondering if there's anything that you think we as Americans should be learning from what's successful elsewhere to the extent that you know about that on the economic front. But more generally, I'm also interested whether anyone has anything to say about whether there will be differential effects on developed nations as opposed to the developing world with respect to emerging from the pandemic in economic terms. Anybody want to take a crack at either of those? And I think kind I, of the bullet answers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... My bullet answer is that we are squandering a lot of opportunity to learn from these policy changes because we are not collecting information that we know we need. Um, I thought it was really disturbing. A panel I was on last week noted that in all the school reopenings in that had happened in Europe so far, very little information um, was collected that would allow folks to link those reopenings to subsequent cases, which just mm -hmm. seems like a first order, super basic, um, grad student level type exercise to do. So just to put it out there, we're doing tons of experiments and we're not really collecting what we need. And I, I think just underscoring that we need to do that to make this efficient and effective is super important. Eric or Lisa? Sure, uh, th that's a big question, but I'll be bullet and, and say, look, I think one of the interesting paradoxes is that Everyone's correctly pointing out that there's going to be a pullback in international travel and trade of physical goods and services, a reduction in globalization on many of those dimensions. But I think what people are missing is I think there's going to be a surge in globalization of information work and digitization. When you go remote, you can work 10 miles away, 1,000 miles away, or 10,000 miles away. And um, that's going to put a lot of information workers in, in a global labor market. Economists talk about factor price equalization. The idea that if there's somebody uh, just as smart and productive as you elsewhere willing to do the job, um, then employers are going to look for those opportunities. And that's going to have a profound effect on people, both in other countries and in the United States. All right, Lisa, we can give you the last word if you wish for it. Yeah, no, I was just going to say on the labor market side, I think the U.S. could learn a lot from other countries that do a better job of maintaining the tie between the worker and the employer when there's a temporary downturn and there's a temporary need to, to cut on costs. So for instance, in Germany, uh, where there's a way to reduce people's workloads, but still keep them attached to the employer, the CARES Act has some provisions like that. And we should be emphasizing those and um, uh, communicating those because again, in the recovery, uh, there's going to be much more damage done to people who have just had their, had their ties severed with their employers than people who are still attached to their employers, even if they do need to be retrained or something like that. Terrific. Well, I want to thank our three panelists for this opening session on the economic road out of the pandemic. Um, we're going to take a short break now and reassemble with a, a second session on various humanistic and social concerns about the pandemic, um, including concerns about the election, testing and tracing, and some other things as well. So um, thanks once again, and we'll see you all again in uh, less than 10 minutes. Welcome back everybody to the second uh, HAI conference on COVID-19 and AI, the path um, out of the crisis. Um, our second session today is going to examine some of the social dimensions of the pandemic. And you, know, you might be wondering why is an institute on artificial intelligence um, discussing something that might not have any direct connection to AI. And before we begin with the session, I just wanted to mention to anybody just joining that the very premise of the Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence is that the development and deployment of AI 
needs to be done in a way that takes um, into account the expertise of people across all disciplines, the humanistic, the ethical, the social dimensions of artificial intelligence. And that's true as well of the pandemic. And so although you might not hear much about AI specifically in the um, next session, I think it's essential that we examine these humanistic and social and ethical dimensions of the crisis. And so that's why we've assembled um, a terrific group of people to discuss just that. Um, I'd like to welcome our first speaker today. Her name is Danielle Allen. She is the James Bryant Conant University Professor at Harvard University. She's also the director of the Center for Ethics at Harvard. And she and her colleagues have been um, um, developing a very important proposal that's received some attention in the national discourse concerning testing, tracing, and supported isolation, uh, a pathway to pandemic resilience. So Danielle, you're welcome to share your screen, turn your audio on, and start your presentation. Thanks so much, Rob. I am not going to share my screen today. I am just going to change. I hope that will be okay with everybody. Rob asked me to talk about an effective strategy for responding to the pandemic, and circumstances in this country have changed so dramatically in the past week that I think it requires some adjustment of perspective. I have been watching the unfolding of the ineffective pandemic response in this country and have seen it as a part of a developing legitimacy crisis, um, evidence of failures of governance in this country. I think we now have to face the fact that we do broadly indeed uh, confront a, a legitimacy crisis. So that means a question about how to have an effective pandemic response is a question of how do you respond effectively to a pandemic in a context where public institutions have collapsing legitimacy. That makes pandemic response all the harder. Nonetheless, I think it brings to the fore that the single most important feature of an effective pandemic response is a viable and valid social contract. What do I mean by that concept? I mean the idea that in any given society, there needs to be a commitment of citizens to one another and of the governance institutions to the entirety of the citizenry. I think in this country, in the US, the first, the beginning of the ineffectiveness of our response was the willingness of people to entertain the idea that we might abandon parts of our community, perhaps abandon the elderly, for example, or then soon after abandon essential workers, that they be out there working but without adequate supports of testing and contact tracing to keep them healthy as a community always in an open economy. For them, the economy was never closed. So the first element of an effective pandemic response and the first element of a response to legitimacy crisis are the same. Rebuilding the principle that we don't abandon anyone. We don't abandon the elderly. We don't abandon essential workers. We don't abandon communities of color. You start from the get-go with the premise that you have to design a policy solution that rests on that proposition that you don't abandon anybody. The entire purpose of a social contract is to deliver safety and happiness to the whole people. That expressing that commitment, standing up for it, seems to me the first element of an effective pandemic response. The second element of an effective pandemic response is then to ask a question that's not about trade-offs in the first instance. Instead, it's a question about how to align or integrate our multiple overarching objectives in a constitutional democracy that aspires to delivery, freedom, equality, and opportunity for all. That means our policy question at the beginning of the pandemic should have been, what's a response that integrates protecting lives, protecting liberties, and protecting livelihoods? We never actually asked that question of whether or not there was a way to integrate all those three things. Right from the get-go, we started talking about trade-offs. You shouldn't properly engage in a conversation about trade-offs if you haven't first explored whether or not there's a solution space that permits integration of all three objectives. Indeed, there was a solution, there still is a solution that integrates all three of those objectives. That solution is to pursue suppression of the virus through diagnostic testing and contact tracing. Those tools can be used to, to drive the prevalence of the disease close to zero. They've been used already effectively in that regard in Germany, in Taiwan, in New Zealand, in Australia, in South Korea. Also, of course, China and Singapore, there's a different story to be told there. The important point is that democracies protective of liberties have also used suppression effectively. Taiwan saw GDP growth in the first quarter of 1.5%. That's evidence that that strategy also is the best one for the economy. 
Taiwan also is able to use various privacy protective approaches to contact tracing. Germany too has established very high standards for privacy as it has also employed contact tracing in its approach to fighting the pandemic. So testing, tracing and supported isolation are the tool to use to suppress the disease. That's a tool that continues to be within our reach in this country. In fact, it's gotten closer within our reach every week. Testing capacity has massively increased. New forms of diagnostic testing, new methodologies Greater, a greater possibility of scaling up have been approved by the FDA within a matter of the last few weeks. There will be continued new opportunities and scaling up in the next week or two to come. So suppression continues to be the best tool for disease control that also simultaneously protects lives, protects livelihoods, protects liberties um, all at once. In order to use this tool effectively, however, in the context, especially of a legitimacy crisis, one really has to ask the question of can public health institutions deliver what we need with regard to contact tracing programs. This is a program where in order to break the chain of transmission, what you do is with every COVID positive individual, you engage with them to identify whom they've been in touch with, to whom may have exposed the disease. And then those people too are invited, encouraged, asked to make appointments to have tests. The goal is to ensure that for every COVID positive person, 25 more people are tested. If you can achieve levels of diagnostic testing at that rate, you can suppress the disease. How to do this then in the context of a legitimacy crisis? The best models for contact tracing are ones that grew up in later stages of the HIV AIDS process and response, wherein it was recognized that community organizations would be the most effective um, entities, agents to provide contact tracing to the communities that they served and in which they're already trusted. So, there's an important program in New York called NYC Knows that recruits community organizations in as partners who then those community organizations stand up to contact tracing programs for the networks of people with whom they're already connected, already involved. That's my view of where we need to go with contact tracing in this country, that we would be best off if our public health institutions could recruit community organizations as partners, that community organizations work in contexts where they're trusted, let them work with the resources and capacities of cultural connection and affinity that will make them most effective. The goal in all of this work is to bring justice, health, and democracy together. If one pursues the health objectives by means of forms of community empowerment, that becomes another element of a foundation for restoring prospects for justice, health, and democracy for all. So in the context of a legitimacy crisis, what's the pathway to an effective response to COVID? Don't abandon anybody. That has to be the first principle. Empower communities to take charge of their own health. Equip them with the tools and the resources that they need in order to do that. Pursue integration of protection of life, livelihood, and liberty. Those, I think, are the elements for effectiveness. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Danielle. We're going to shift next to Nate Persily, who is a professor of law at Stanford University and the co-director of the Cyber Policy Center. Uh, Nate's work focuses on American election law, examining voting rights, political parties, campaign finance. He's the co-author of the leading election law casebook called The Law of Democracy. Um, he's been examining at the Cyber Policy Center and an associated project on democracy and the internet a great variety of issues concerning the health of democracy in its digital form. And um, we examined in our last conference issues concerning what some people call the infodemic, the um, misinformation and disinformation about the pandemic that parallels the public health crisis. Um, Nate has turned a great deal of his attention over the past weeks and in the next coming months to an issue um, absolutely central to Americans, which is how in the context of a pandemic can we conduct a healthy and safe election? Um, Nate, the floor is yours, and please share your screen and turn your video and audio on. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I would like to pick up where uh, Daniel Allen left off, which is that uh, there, there's a legitimacy crisis uh, in the United States. Uh, we're seeing it play out in the streets, uh, and elections are the focal point for um, a lot of uh, what may, might be the tests of a nation state and its ability um, to, to uh, communicate messages of legitimacy. And uh, the pandemic could not come at a worse time in the United States because um, uh, it affects the election in, in an integral way. 
for the most part, my comments are not um, tech related uh, or, or AI related, but I, I wanna just say one word at the beginning about the influence of technology on this election, given the COVID environment, which is that um, all of the sort of analog ways that we have campaigned and registered voters and participated in elections are hindered in the COVID uh, pandemic environment. And so uh, our reliance on technology for this election could not be greater. Uh, and so all of the problems and weaknesses that we saw in the system, whether it was disinformation or the cybersecurity of the different electoral systems in the US, um, those problems are only magnified in the COVID environment as jurisdictions are scrambling to try to adapt to uh, the various challenges that the pandemic poses. Um, I do think that, that we are facing a crisis now and just pulling off the basics of this election. Um, we are losing poll workers. We are losing polling places. Um, um, we are trying to make a massive shift in the way that we vote as a nation in a very short period of time. This has never happened in the United States. Uh, and so what I'm going to talk about here are the challenges that we are facing and um, the particular obstacles that the pandemic poses uh, for the election in November. Um, I'm going to share my screen and, and, and do just a few slides in, in the six minutes I have remaining. Um, so I want to focus just on what the, the actual problem is, which is how do you shift uh, tens of millions of voters from a system of voting that they become accustomed to, to one that is unfamiliar to them, right? And so the, the solutions are not terribly exotic here. We know that we have to move as many people to mail balloting as possible, but also we need to retrofit as many polling places as possible um, in order to make sure that people can vote with social distance. And so um, I think it's important to understand that this is not as easy as people think. Uh, and also that these options represent a continuum, not merely um, a dichotomous choice. And by that, I mean that you're going to see many variations in the way we vote in November, from the sort of uh, typical paradigmatic election day polling place to early voting centers that aggregate several polling places together, to obviously mail balloting at home where you then drop your, your ballot into, a, um, you know, into the mailbox, to mail balloting, which then you drop into a um, publicly sort of provided uh, drop box and the like. And so there are all these different options in the way people are voting and different jurisdictions are gonna be uh, moving in one or the other uh, direction. Now, one of the sort of uh, constraints on us dealing with the pandemic and its election related effects is how decentralized our electoral system is in the United States. Um, so not only do we devolve responsibility for federal elections primarily to um, 50 states, but they in turn devolve it down to roughly 10,000 local election jurisdictions, which have an enormous amount of discretion in the basic mechanics of how we run this election. Um, the uh, vote by mail landscape, you know, has a regional bias to it, as you can see from the map, which is that the vote by mail has been you know, used with, uh, you know, quite considerably in the Western states with uh, Oregon, Washington, Utah, Colorado, and Hawaii being all vote by mail. We here in California have roughly, you know, six, uh, two thirds of our votes have been cast by mail. And now we are also going to be mailing ballots to every voter. Uh, places like Arizona also have roughly three quarters that um, people who vote by mail. But as you can see throughout the rest of the United States, there's considerable variation as to whether states require excuses to have an absentee ballot or whether you can just do no excuse absentee voting. And uh, so what this means is that we've got a patchwork quilt of, of different uh, regulations and opportunities for voting around the country. Um, and, and what we will see, particularly in states like Wisconsin, um, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, uh, which don't have long histories of vote by mail, is a massive shift to move tens of millions of people uh, to a different way of voting. This has, of course, led to different concerns about the mail balloting system. Obviously, the president has been repeating uh, the notion of mail ballot fraud. The, there is um, you know, no evidence that mail ballot uh, systems, like in the places that have been using all mail ballots, have higher incidents of fraud than any other. 
right? And so that needs to be uh, put to rest. Um, but, but there are other concerns with vote by mail. And, and this is important, as we, especially as we think about the racial uh, biases in the electoral system, that it, uh, vote by mail tends to be used by whites, tends to be used by people who are uh, higher education uh, and older. Uh, and um, we even see in the registration numbers that are coming out of the primary states, significant racial biases in who is registering to get a mail ballot. And so that's why we're going to, why we, it's very important that we have actual polling places as well as mail ballot opportunities because there's the concern about disenfranchisement as well as a number of errors that people make in the mail balloting process if they are first time voters. Um, but in addition to the actual wrongdoing that, that, that uh, people- One minute. About and the actual problems, there is the real concern of perceptions here. And a, an election which is run through my mail balloting is one that's different than the normal election. And we should not expect um, the results to be ready on election night, right? And, and the, the fact that um, you may have a different winner on election night than you would have several days later when, the, um, when all the votes are counted is something that's really of concern uh, in a uh, you know a media environment like the one that we exist in, where you know conspiracy theories, disinformation, and the like can be propagated, and so we need safe polling places in addition to mail, um, because voters are reluctant to change the way that they've been accustomed to voting, um, and uh, there are certain populations in particular for which mail voting might be uh, difficult. Um, but this too is is quite challenging, right? Because we need to retrofit our polling places to make sure that they are safe for people to vote with social distance. Um, that is, the other countries, for example, South Korea has shown that you can run an election with social distance without it, you know, effectively. Uh, and and so in those in that country, for example, that they um, had voters come in, they had their temperature checked, they were. Uh, six feet apart from each other. They were given gloves, they were given masks, and there was all kinds of other um, uh, protective equipment for the poll workers, right? But here in the United States, we, you know, have, we rely on um, volunteers principally to be our poll workers, uh, and most of them are over the age of 60, um, and uh, they are the population that's most at risk, and so you are seeing jurisdictions lose um, sometimes as much as half of the poll workers that they usually rely on. In addition, we, uh, you know, we rely on sort of the contribution of polling places in, in a sense. Um, and um, as schools take themselves out of commission, as senior living centers take themselves out as polling places, same with firehouses, we're seeing a massive shortage in the number of polling places uh, for November. Um, and, and particularly if schools, uh, which one third of the votes cast in the US are cast at schools, if schools take themselves out of commission, we're gonna have a real shortage of the kind of accessible, ubiquitous polling places that can ensure social distance uh, in a pandemic. And then finally, both in the mail balloting and in the polling place sort of PPE realm, we see competition among the states for the things that you need, the materials you need in order to pull off the election. So just as states have been competing against each other for ventilators and um, face masks, uh, there's the risk that they will be competing against each other in order to get the special paper that you need for mail ballots, the special paper and envelopes that you need for that are properly sized for these ballots, as well as the, all of the PPE that's going to be necessary for poll workers like face shields and masks and uh, gloves, hand sanitizer, and the like. And so what is to be done? Um, we need massive education and outreach, uh, which is particularly difficult in this media environment where which is so amenable to disinformation. Um, we need to amplify the voices of the local election officials so that they can communicate messages about how to vote uh, and have your vote counted. Um, we need time more than anything else. We need to lengthen the voting period so that people can um, uh, have more days to vote in the states where it's, where it's difficult to do so. And we need greater time for the casting and the counting of ballots. As I said before, um, we need to resist the temptation to call the victor on election night. And so responsible media organizations uh, need to uh, exercise patience, which is of course in very short supply uh, these days. And we need to be creative in the way that we start thinking about polling place voting. There have been proposals about curbside voting with, uh, for people with cars, taking a number and voting. So sort of using base technology that we have in deli counters and the like, um, so that you don't have to actually wait in the line uh, in order to vote. Um, 
we here at, at Stanford have had uh, quite a bit of research on a lot of these issues of vote by mail. My colleagues, uh, Andy Hall, uh, and has written uh, quite a bit on vote by mail and how there are no partisan effects by vote by mail. We also in the law school have examined things like verifying signatures on mail ballots and how to do this to ensure uh, fairness. But we've also just started up a project here um, with MIT uh, called the Healthy Elections Project, which is gonna try to help uh, local jurisdictions make the transition to mail ballot and healthy polling places. Nate, can I ask you to wrap it up there? Yeah, that, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Nate. And for everyone listening, I wanna remind you that we um, welcome your own questions about this panel um, for Danielle Allen, Nate Persley, or our third speaker, Marie Chishaka. Um, to ask a question, go to our website, hai.stanford.edu, and you can find a link there to pose a question online. We're gonna turn now to our final presentation of this session. Let me introduce to you Marie Chishaka. She is the International Policy Director at the Stanford Cyber Policy Center and a Policy Fellow at the Institute for Human-Centered AI. She served as a member of the European Parliament from 2009 to 2019, and she was the founder of the European Parliament's Intergroup on the Digital Agenda for Europe. Maricha, thanks so much for joining us from Amsterdam, and uh, please share your screen and uh, turn your audio on. Thanks so much. I'm actually uh, very happy to see you on Zoom, but I'm not going to be sharing any slides, so feel free to look out of the window or uh, enjoy a little walk. If you're still sheltering in place, uh, all you have to do is listen. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, uh, and I've been asked to share some observations about governmental obligations for protection during contact tracing of COVID-19 infected people. And I believe, and I wanted to start with this, especially now that it is always essential to point out the difference between democratic and non-democratic governments when we talk about the obligation of governments. And especially during crisis, this is a distinction that is being tested. Uh, of course, I, I echo the concerns that many have uh, shared about what is happening in the United States. Uh, but when we think about democratic principles being tested, I think particularly of the abuse of power vis-a-vis -vis un unarmed individuals, peaceful protesters and journalists. Uh, but in general, I think this pandemic has become somewhat of a litmus test for democratic government's own commitments to practice what they preach. Now, as a reminder, in Europe, as well as in the United States, the legislative steps that have been taken to better protect people's data and their privacy were a reaction to the excessive intrusion by governments and law enforcement in the name of countering terrorism and providing security, for example, after 9-11. And so I think it is important to be extra mindful of civil liberties and fundamental freedoms when the urgency to act fast is pushed by the unprecedented circumstances like the pandemic and COVID-19 that we're dealing with right now. And in particular, the eagerness with which apps to fight the pandemic have been embraced has, has been remarkable, I think. Um, I was particularly closely involved with the scrutinizing of that process in my home country, the Netherlands, where I am during the pandemic. But many of the points I'm gonna make uh, are relevant for other societies and other uh, governmental proposals to uh, engage technology in the process of contacting, uh, of contact tracing, excuse me. Uh, and in many cases, I think it was still entirely unclear what kinds of functions the apps were supposed to perform. I know that many of you um, calling in today and listening to us are very familiar with technology, but the general audience thought that an app was sort of one thing you could take off the shelves to contact trace people. And the willingness to sacrifice protection of fundamental rights and security among the broader uh, public, in my opinion, was significant, especially after we've seen a lot of engagement and pushback from uh, populations in Europe uh, before. And many have focused uh, also experts on the obligation of governments and companies alike that are involved in developing these apps to fight the pandemic to ensure privacy and cybersecurity are guaranteed. But I would say that questions of impact and obligations go much further. So with a group of scientists, I signed a letter to the Dutch government urging it to engage experts from multiple disciplines to assess not only whether a contact tracing app would add value, but also assess the impact of tracing people more broadly. 
what happens to a society when people are being monitor, monitored for months or, or years? Do they change their behavior? How do they perceive their freedoms and rights? Are there unintended consequences or precedents? Uh, we also urge to ensure that any app would have a sunset clause and a very narrowly defined goal so that it could not creep from supporting doctors into being a precondition for entering an airplane or taking out an insurance. Mission creep, uh, in other words, should be prevented. But we also urge the government to be very clear that an app cannot be mandatory and should always be voluntary. Now, going further down the list of questions to be answered, and there are many, uh, we, in, in very basic sense in this country, and I know many countries are in the same situation, do not have sufficient testing capacity. And what you cannot test medically, you cannot trace in an app either. Uh, then there's other concerns that we can learn about from other parts of the world, like in South Korea, where, where contact tracing and testing have been quite widespread, but where people's concern to be stigmatized for carrying the virus is now greater than the concern for actually uh, being, being infected uh, with, with COVID-19 because there is such a response and through the sharing of information, uh, the possibility to identify people and where they may have um, been infected. So besides logistical questions, operational questions, security and privacy questions, clarity and transparency demands, it's important to look more broadly at alternative models. Quite a bit of success has been found with either manual tracing or keeping a diary. And this may sound like a very analog past century uh, solution, but actually it has engaged people much more personally in taking responsibility for their behavior. Uh, I would also um, uh, encourage us to look more broadly in the sense that if governments have to look in terms of broad scenarios in what it takes to open up societies while preserving health, an economic argument for hiring human contact tracers over AI-driven ones may carry weight. So it's important to look beyond just technological solutions. In any case, and this builds on what um, Professor Allen said before as well, all efforts should go into ensuring that there is trust trust in the technology and its applications, but also trust between people and trust in government, which I think is, is a theme in our panel as well. Governments, democratic governments, have had to ask extraordinary discipline and sacrifice from their populations. To be locked down or sheltered in place, to keep children out of schools, elderly people alone in their homes, people working from home with all the economic consequences only happens in extraordinary times. And though I think many of us feel the end of the stretch of people's patience, the need for governments to retain the trust of populations, especially now, I believe will probably be tested more strongly down the road compared to how much it's been tested already. So any false sense of security from an app that renders either too many false positives or false negatives can be devastating. And on the other hand, overly trusting apps to simply be responsible for notifying people when they are at risk, risks loosening uh, other steps of responsible behavior like physical distancing or hygiene measures. And so all of this means that there's so much at stake that at some point there will be intense scrutiny of companies that have provided the apps as well as of governments that have possibly promised too much of what an app can solve. So in conclusion, I do believe that technology can help. We've talked about this uh, during a previous um, HAI uh, session, which I think was, was very important on April 1st. Um, technology can be supportive, but it's not a panacea. And I would also urge people not to see it as such. Uh, we need clear definitions of use, function, checks and balances, governance that is clear and responsible. And even then, contact tracing apps are not a magic wand. So I actually hope, uh, and this is my last point, that governments will use a similar approach to what we try to build at HAI, which is to bring various disciplines together to make sure that there is not unintended tunnel vision or tech determinism, but that we really have a multidisciplinary view uh, of the problems that need to be tackled and what is needed to do that. And I think that that is the best way to build trust and inclusiveness. So I'll end there and I wanna thank you very much. Look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Maritza.
I want to remind our viewers that you can go to our website to post questions. At this point, I'll invite all of our panelists, Danielle, Nate, as well as Marie, to turn your video and audio back on. And I'll uh, throw it over to my co-host, Russ, for the first question. Yes, uh, I want to make sure Mar Marice gets back on. Good. Uh, thank you so much for these comments, which are germane to our discussion today. And I want to build a little bit on Mar Marice's last comment about trust, because it is it is my impression that trust in many spheres is at an all time low. And I'm and uh, I start as a, as a university teacher who has noticed students who were sent home, who are not happy, and who have even lost trust in their university. But uh, more more globally and importantly, the trauma to the black community in the last week uh, has eroded trust in major ways. And then if you look at the last few months, there are multiple communities which have lost faith in many of the, um, in, in government and other organizations. And so in that context, uh, my question is, as you think about what you've just told us, I, it's my impression that the challenge is even more difficult now. And are there ways that we should be thinking about uh, regaining that trust? And I know that's a tough one. All right, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, I think we have to be honest about the fact that the, what's happened in the past week is um, just people saying out loud what's been true in terms of people's understanding of the world they live in for quite a long time. And so um, I think the, it's not exact, so trust has been eroding for a long time. All, there are all kinds of metrics of that. And um, there have been red alerts in the last decade that it was getting exceptionally bad, um, that we sort of, you know, relatively complacently sailed by without attending to. And I think we're just at a point where um, enough people are ready to say, we're not gonna sail by any longer, that that's the issue. And so um, there is a need to rebuild trust, but it's a deep need and not a sort of fix it tomorrow kind of question. And the only way I think it can be done is for there to be serious engagement in the US at least in um, rebuilding effective governance um, through our political institutions. So take just the very immediate issue of the policing context. It's not as if people haven't been trying to improve policing <laughs> for like, you know, a couple of decades. <laughs> So if our institutions can't deliver something that we all pretty much already knew we needed, well, then, you know, you have a pretty basic problem. So in that regard, for me, the question of what would it take to rebuild trust is one of what would be the most powerful set of actions we could take together now in the coming weeks to um, engage in that process of institutional reform and reconstitution. So uh, I think that there's work Congress needs to do to change how it functions. I think every single city government should be thinking about how it achieves genuinely responsive and empowering forms of government. And in some ways, that probably means in the first instance in short order, actually already revisiting key decision-making mechanisms. Who's at the table for decision-making? Um, so at any rate, that's not a silver bullet or kind of quick solution to the problem. It's only to say there's a huge amount of work in front of us, but I think we'll be better off if we can name it, square, um, begin to lay out its pieces and begin to build cross-racial, cross-partisan, cross-ideological coalitions committed to a process of building a better normal, not you know the new normal everybody's been talking about, which I like describe as rinse and repeat with face masks, um, but a better normal. Danielle, let me, before I go to the others, let me just, you, you gave us a really beautiful kind of three-step process, which was very attractive and it sounded right. Uh, and but as I was listening to it, I wondered if we had lost a chance to implement that a lot of that because of the things that have happened in the last week and also in the last couple of months. And so I guess I'm asking, do you re up on that? And 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 you stand that the, that we can still you know address the legitimacy crisis, align and integrate objectives, and and implement testing and tracing in the current environment because that would be a hopeful, positive thing to hear. So um, I, um, I, I'm always, when I say this, I'm not an optimist, I'm a, it's not an optionist. <laughs> we don't have a choice, okay? We have to do this work. So yes, it's harder now even than it was three months ago. It was already really hard three months ago. So 
I, you know, it's, it's very uh, sad that it's even harder, but it's harder for understandable reasons without any question. So, and to some extent, I'm grateful that the kind of fundamental difficulty that we've all faced, namely a legitimacy crisis in our public institutions is now plainly visible for all to see. So it's not a silent crisis any longer. And my hope is that with a crisis that's now plainly visible, we can all name it um, and begin the collective work of thinking it through and engaging, finding our resources of spirit and empathy um, to find a path. Thank you. Uh, Nate, I think I saw your hand up and my, yeah. Mariche, we definitely wanna hear about the European perspective. I, I just wanna sort of complicate matters a little bit in thinking about the, the, the point about trust is absolutely right. Um, but we, we sort of have to talk about trust and polarization at the same time. So there's this massive loss of trust that actually is, you know, that we've seen as, as Danielle said, over time, over the last decades. Um, and we're seeing that not just in governmental institutions, but we're seeing that in all kinds of elite institutions, including among others, universities. Um, and then there's the problem of polarization, which dovetails with trust, because part of it is that you, the massive loss of trust sometimes comes from different sources, right? Depending on whether you're on the right or the left. And so what's been what's happened with the pandemic is that we are seeing right both a lack of trust uh, because the government is not and other institutions are not up to the task, and then you have polarization, right? Whether and you see that uh, whether it's about face masks or hydrochloric or for that matter, mail balloting, right, that the elite level um, and, and how to deal with it. So that you, um, that makes building the kind of coalitions that are necessary to then have a kind of unified approach to build trust and legitimacy that much more difficult when you have elites, right, who are polarized along partisan lines. Mariche? Yeah, just, I mean, this is a difficult subject, but I did want to bring two parts together of this discussion. So I often think back about the promise with which social media came about and that it was going to engage more people in the democratic process, that it was going to empower the voiceless and basically jump to where we are today with so many lessons learned that this promise did not turn into a reality automatically, right? And that in fact, uh, for, for, I think, a lack of checks and balances, a lack of critical assessment of what these technologically enabled platforms actually brought, uh, we, we kind of lost track of the unintended or sometimes um, uh, to be expected consequences of some of these business models uh, would be. And so um, I think that besides the very valid points that were made about <clears throat> strengthening institutions, we should also look at the mechanisms that are necessary in order to keep power in check. I think that that, you know, as an outsider, I'm a European uh, having served in, in politics, but when I look at the United States, one of the core lessons that we learned when we studied the United States uh, and um, uh, American democracy was always checks and balances. I'm not convinced that it's working as it was promised. Uh, and I think that this, um, uh, you know, lack of checks and balances within the democratic system, within institutions can also be applied to questions of how well are checks and balances working on other vectors of power, uh, including social media companies. So hopefully we can consider the very pressing and disturbing, frankly, events as a wake up call to go back to what foundational principles are the core ingredients of a free society. And I would say the rule of law and all its, its core principles are vital there and try to fill them in systematically and, and be willing to think critically of our own assumptions and our own hopes perhaps, right? I had a lot of hope of what um, new technologies would bring in, in terms of democratizing, emancipating, empowering the voiceless. I wanted that to be true, uh, but that doesn't automatically make it true. And I think in, in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of people who have good intentions, but that doesn't automatically make it true. So let's also encourage ourselves to think critically and go back to um, the core of what normally normally, and hopefully in the future, again, um, makes for a truly democratic society. Terrific. Well, I want to um, now get some questions from the audience in. I have one question that I think is chiefly directed at Danielle and Maricha, and a second question for Nate. Um, Danielle, I want to pick up on something that you ended with, which was that the, 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 the tracing mechanism that you and your colleagues have proposed is not a digital one, not a matter of digital surveillance, but a manual one. And in fact, 
Um, it wasn't just um, 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 an invocation of that, but a very deliberate identification of community groups and community leaders who would help carry that out. Um, I, I wonder whether or not you can say something about um, the legitimacy crisis as a whole with respect to the identification of community leaders, community groups, and working in partnership with, with local um, state federal government, and if you think that's an important mechanism. And in addition, whether the idea of manual tracing, is, your belief is that that will be on the public health front more effective than digital tracing? Or is it that you don't trust the technologies, perhaps in some of the ways that Mauricio suggested, to referee the trade-off between privacy and safety in the way that manual tracing can do better? Um, if you can say a bit more about the, the identification of community groups and community leaders as an essential element, um, I'd like then to, to tip that into a conversation with Maricha about the trade-offs between privacy and public health safety through techno technological means. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, thanks for that, Rob. Well, let me just start by saying something about contact tracing, uh, what it is as an activity. So it's it's an old-fashioned activity. Public health has been doing contact tracing, you know, for ever really probably, but certainly for the last century in the U.S. And we use it regularly for tuberculosis, measles, things like that. It happens to be that those outbreaks are typically much smaller. So what we're not used to doing is thinking about contact tracing at scale. To think about it at scale, you have to recognize that it's got sort of two information problems that it's trying to solve. So COVID, as you all know, is very distinctive because about half of the transmission is by people who don't have symptoms. Either they will never have symptoms and are asymptomatic or they're pre-symptomatic, they don't have symptoms yet, they're early in the disease course. So they're passing this on unknowingly. Okay, that's the information problem. And there's two categories of information problem. You might pass it on unknowingly to somebody to whom you're very close. You live with the person or work with the person, or you might unknowingly pass it on to a stranger in a public space. And those, there are two different solutions for those problems. You don't need digital tools to trace your intimate and close proximate networks. And that's where the most significant transmission is, in fact. That said, there is also transmission in public transport in particular that seems to have been something to do with why New York was hit as badly as it was, is sort of the reliance on public transport. So digital tools are useful for that latter context where you're trying to notify strangers. And I sort of, I tell the story of, um, I spent summer in LA years ago and got incredibly sick. Um, just, I thought I was gonna die, I couldn't get out of bed, spine racked with pain. I'm an idiot and I didn't call the doctor. And after you know, a week or 10 days, I got better and I went walking my dog again in the same park I always went to. And there on a tree was a poster that said, be careful, people have been catching West Nile virus from mosquitoes in this park, okay? That's that second information problem that when Acadia tells strangers they may have been exposed, that's where the digital apps I think are a useful tool. But on balance, as I said, most transmission is in that intimate context where you just need a person to help you remember where you've been, who you were with. Do you wanna tell your friend or intimate partner yourself or do you want um, somebody else to tell them anonymously, et cetera? So that's definitely a job for human beings. Um, and as it happens, you know, again, that's the bigger part of the job, so that's what we focused on, precisely because of that proximity, that closeness of contact that you have in that information setting, um, it's important that you be able to speak with somebody who speaks your language, sounds like you, knows your neighborhood, knows what life's like where you live, and so that's why the community organizations element is so important. Maricha, how do you see it with respect to the, the um, choice between manual contact tracing and digital contact tracing? Well, I think contact tracing is one element. As Professor Allen said, it's um, it's old fashioned in many ways. It's been done throughout the centuries, even because it makes sense that you want to understand who has been in touch with whom. But in many societies, one, there's not enough testing capacity. So you can only really think about what kind of capacity you need if you, one, have a hold on the numbers, which have now dropped again, but you want to have the capacity to test, not, not incidentally, but systemically, because of all the reasons that Professor Allen gave. Um, people can be infected without knowing it, you know, infecting others without knowing it, et cetera, et cetera. So even if you get tested today, you may need another test two days later, et cetera. So I think we need a better understanding of what an app might do to help. So I'm in a very densely populated area. Uh, if I have my Bluetooth on and my neighbor, I'm pointing here, but like at the end of my arm is the wall. And if they're sitting on the couch, the Bluetooth uh, a bl uh, Bluetooth, sorry, I was um, confusing with YouTube. Bluetooth uh, would signal that we are close, but there's a wall between us. So we would never be able to infect each other. Same with 
apartment buildings, when people are walking past each other's windows to get to their doors, ping, 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 it would all be contact. And how do you filter for that? I have not heard a solution. Uh, similarly, what, what about healthcare workers? Uh, my sister is a doctor. If all people who work in care, who are on the one hand exposed to more infected individuals, uh, and on the other hand are better able to protect themselves, are part of the modeling of what the app is supposed to trace, then it can be very confusing. On the other hand, if you take out all the medical workers, then you may not be tracing sufficiently. So I'm happy to think about technological solutions. I think there is a space for it, but only when and if we can very clearly ask what problem needs to be solved. And for some odd reason, despite all the practice that we've seen across the world now, I have not seen a best practice. There are a number of practices where there has been too much of a compromise of the right to privacy or people have been stigmatized or uh, there has not been an uptake because people don't trust it or there has been a uh, risk for false positives or false negatives, which is all very problematic, especially when people are gonna lean on the app because they think it is a magic solution or a super good solution and are not gonna take physical distancing, hygiene measures and other care uh, to protect themselves and particularly others like the most vulnerable in our society. So I think there's much more merit in doing scenario planning with multiple experts where the key question is, how do we get out of the lockdown without compromising health? The conclusion may be we need technology, the conclusion may be we don't. But to stare only at one part of the solution, I think will make us blind to other parts. And that's basically my point. Um, so before we can even think about a trade-off, let's see if it's necessary and, and what issues are, are on the table. Thank you. All right, uh, Nate, um, a bunch of questions about the election. Um, a few people have asked about uh, whether or not there's something to learn or worry about with respect to Wisconsin. So if state courts, state governments decide to restrict uh, mail-in balloting, um, what recourse, if any, do citizens have? And can you comment on the likelihood that the Supreme Court might be asked to weigh in on the um, permissibility of all mail-in um, ballots or um, a sharp increase in mail-in ballots and what that might portend? Well, we actually don't need to look very far because the Texas Supreme Court just issued an opinion that um, basically uh, held up the no, the excuse required absentee ballot system that Texas has and said that the fact that, you know, you, you are able to um, get an excuse for a disability or sickness uh, does not necessarily extend to uh, people saying, well, they're afraid to vote in person so they're because of their health and so therefore they should be able to avail themselves of the sickness or disability excuse. So, so we have now, you know, a post-Wisconsin case where um, and citizens wanted to vote by mail ballot and uh, the court said no. Um, it's possible the US Supreme Court is going to get involved in some of this. They did get involved in the, in the Wisconsin case um, and, and said that you know, the judge's decision to try to extend the deadline for absentee ballots uh, to be cast was uh, beyond sort of the judge's authority. And so they put down a marker here and I, I think we, we shouldn't expect that it's gonna go in the direction of say pro-mail balloting. Um, in general, the, what happened in Wisconsin, just so people understand, um, that, that this was the kind of perfect storm of, of political and administrative dysfunction. Whereas it was unclear even the day before the primary whether the election was gonna go forward. And so um, they had a massive shortage in polling places, say in, in Milwaukee City, where they only opened five polling places out of several hundred they usually have. Um, they had to call on the National Guard to staff several uh, polling places. Um, there were long lines at some of those polling places in Milwaukee. Uh, but they did uh, have unprecedented mail turnout uh, there. And so while it's, it's seen as the poster child for election dysfunction this season, um, you did shift over a million voters to vote by mail so that the turnout in the primary was actually not as low as one would have expected. Um, but, that, but Wisconsin is now the object lesson about what we have to avoid for November, right? We need to plan now, get all the polling places up and running that are possible, make sure the procurement happens for mail balloting, uh, and then also to get the rules straight uh, in the courts and elsewhere. Great, well, I wanna draw this session to a close just with the following uh, observation. 
Um, it's a piece of conventional wisdom for the past month or two that the pandemic presents us not just a public health crisis, but an economic crisis. And I think the way that um, uh, we've discussed uh, in this session that we need to, as it were, up the ante even more. Um, we have what amounts to a legitimacy crisis in so many of the major institutions that are responsible for um, helping us see a path forward out of the public health crisis as well as the economic crisis. And if we think in terms of a social contract as uh, Danielle Allen invited us to, of looking for a way to be, ensure that we leave no constituency and no citizen behind, no one gets abandoned, and think at least with the possibility that in certain circumstances, the kinds of familiar trade-offs we often present ourselves might not be necessary. We should give ourselves the freedom to imagine that we need not strike trade-offs between liberty and security or between technology and privacy. Um, I think we can stare in front of ourselves at the gravity and scope of the problem and begin perhaps together to imagine a path forward. And so with that, I wanna thank uh, Danielle Allen, Nate Persily, and Mauricio Shaka. And for our audience, we're going to take now another um, eight or nine minute break. We'll reconvene at the half hour mark with our third and final session for the day. Thank you. Welcome back. We are uh, now in our final session of the day. In this session, we will examine the medical road out of COVID. Uh, we hope you've been enjoying the previous sessions and I'm excited to uh, be the host for this final session. Our first speaker is Susan Athey. She's the Economics of Technology Professor at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. Susan's research focuses on the economics of the internet, marketplace design, theory, and intersection of econometrics and machine learning. And currently she is examining how to create markets for new vaccines, something I think we can all agree is a priority. Susan, thanks very much for being with us. Susan, of course, is also an associate director here at the uh, Human Centered AI Center. So welcome, Susan, and take it away. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me here. And um, I'm excited to present this research I've been working on with a fantastic team of co-authors. Let me call out specifically uh, Camilo Castillo, who's a graduating PhD uh, student from Stanford off to UPenn next year. Um, the work we're talking about is actually getting updated in real time. So if you're interested in learning more, um, we actually put up a little website that has an app that can allow you to do different types of modeling at acceleratinght.org. So the problem that was highlighted in the morning session on the economics um, of, of COVID was that actually we have not just an economic problem and or a health problem, but the two are interrelated. It's not just that suddenly pulling a switch and reopening the economy will make things better, but actually workers and consumers need to have confidence about the health problem. At the same time, the health problem is also an economic problem because we need to make investments um, at the government level often, um, but also in the private sector in order to get the health solutions we need to happen as quickly as possible. It's not just a matter of science. The IMF estimates that it's about a $9 trillion hit to the world economy over the two-year period. That's about $375 billion monthly. What we'll argue here is that advancing an effective vaccine by as little as six months um, could generate gains of over $2 trillion, but you could do it for about $100 billion. And that's basically the world's easiest cost-benefit calculation because we're just off by an order of magnitude. The costs are much less than the benefits. And similar arguments apply also to investments in diagnostics and therapeutics. Um, I'm also doing some work in those areas, but today I just wanna focus on vaccines. So what are the market failures we have? We see a lot in the press about how there's a lot of R&D going on in vaccines. And indeed, the initial R&D phase seems to be functioning fairly well. But there's another problem which is less well understood by most people. And that is that since most vaccines fail, firms typically don't want to invest in capacity at risk. Instead, they wait till the vaccine is approved. And what's different between vaccines and say small molecule drugs is that you can't just take the recipe and put it in a factory and start spitting out vaccines the next day. Instead, vaccine production is actually its own complicated process. There's R&D that goes into scaling up manufacturing capacity. And in fact, each step of, each pro of the process and 
each step of each process in each new manufacturing facility has to develop a test, have that test be approved. And then of course you have to pass the test for, for every step. So it's, it's a much more complicated process than you might expect. And it's very difficult to accelerate that process um, in order and still have safety. So if we follow the usual, usual procedure, we could easily have an approved vaccine, but still have to wait six months to get shots in arms at large scale. And that would be a $2 trillion delay. So first of all, we need to get firms to invest at risk. There's another problem, which is that firms also would like to sm smooth capacity utilization over time. And in most cases, that's also what the social planner would want. Um, if you can use a smaller factory to produce the same amount of vaccine as a bigger factory, the smaller factory costs less. But on the other hand, in this case, we, we really want production to be as fast as possible. And so firms are gonna have the incentive to build less capacity and produce vaccines slower than society would want. In this case, we want to build factories, use them really quickly, and then have them be empty later. It costs more, but the benefits are worth it. So to help address this problem, we wanna think about a solution where we pay firms to invest in lots of capacity at risk before the vaccine is approved. Um, but then we still have questions, how much should we build? How many vaccine candidates? And how should, we, um, how should we look at that cost benefit calculation in an environment where we actually have to provide incentives to firms to do the things that we want? So the way we approach that is with a simple economic model where we solve the social planning problem first and then look at an appropriate incentive, and structure, incentive structure to make that happen. So for the social planning problem, we can start by thinking about what are the benefits of accelerating um, the production of the vaccine. So to start, at, at any point in time, we can think about the marginal benefits to vaccinating additional people in a population. Giving initial vaccines to priority groups has the highest bang for the buck. As we move through the population, the later groups have less social benefit than the early groups. So we model that with this sort of diminishing marginal utility. Now we, in this environment, we can see, we can just illustrate graphically what are the benefits from investing in more vaccine candidates that increases your probability of success. And the higher your probability of success of achieving at least one vaccine candidate that has sufficient scale and time, the higher the benefits. If we build more capacity, we vaccinate people faster and that shifts the curve over to the left. Now, with that in place, we can think about the comparison with and without the program. So if we let the status quo go and people wait to start manufacturing at large scale until after they, um, they know the vaccine is effective, there's a delay of, say, six months between knowing the vaccine is effective and safe and having vaccine production. And then once you start, you see this, this curve with diminishing marginal utility. On the other hand, if we accelerate capacity installation, then as soon as the vaccine um, is shown to be safe and effective, we can start vaccinating people at large scale. But in a, another thing will happen is that as soon as you know that this vaccine actually works, you would want to increase your capacity investment at that point. What, what you want to do when you know that the vaccine is actually going to work is going to be different. And indeed, at that point, you can start compelling capacity, repurposing and other types of things, make sure all the supply chain is focused on this one candidate. So you'll start investing in that immediately. And then say six months later, you get another bump in capacity. And the overall benefit is the area under this curve. Now, if you subtract the, the social welfare with and without the program, you get this funny looking shape. Then finally, layering on the probability of success, um, the, the more candidates you invest in, in, the higher the probability of success, and so the more you can scale up um, this curve. Putting that all together, um, we, we then want to figure out how many vaccine candidates should we invest in. We did that by taking data from the WHO on the vaccine candidates. We accounted for their stage of development, and we also accounted for correlated risks among the, the different approaches and, and platforms that the different candidates were using. We use success probabilities based on the historical record, but also adjusting for the fact that everything's going faster this time. So fast is good, but that means that the risks associated with each step may be higher because we've gone faster and haven't gathered as much data at each step. We've put in um, also expert opinions in terms of what these probabilities are, but what we've learned is that people have very differing um, opinions about this. So we've provided this model at the website I mentioned, acceleratinght.org, where you can plug in your own probabilities if you wanna see how that changes things. 
Now, every additional candidate you invest in is going to give you um, additional success probabilities, but of course there's diminishing returns. And so this diminishing return um, uh, plot shows how adding additional candidates to your investment increased your probability of at least one success. We can then um, put that into the model and we'll see this diminishing marginal social benefit from each number, each additional candidate. We've assumed here a constant marginal cost, although in more realistically, if there's supply chain bottlenecks, there might be some uh, convexity to that. Um, so what we end up with is an optimum of 18 drug candidates to invest in. Then finally, to think about how do we design the incentives? We recommend a combination of pay for outcomes or pull financing and push or cost reimbursement. Pull financing can be used to incentivize speed and performance. Um, but it's expensive because say the 18th firm thinks they're not gonna be very likely to succeed. And so you have to have a big prize for that firm to find it worthwhile to make a big investment at risk. So you can reduce the cost of the program by also directly reimbursing people's costs. And we recommend push funding of 85% of costs, um, not 100% because we do want the firms to have some skin in the game so that we don't see poor quality candidates trying to, um, to uh, kind of take advantage of the program. And overall, then we suggest that we should have a, a big price, like $35 a dose for the first billion doses. That creates kind of a race for speed and $5 a dose for the next 2.5 billion. And that together with the 85% cost share, we, we estimate would be enough to get 18 candidates to actually um, participate in the program. So um, we also do some work looking at the benefits of international cooperation and the additional gains that, be, that can be had if countries actually coordinate some of their investments to get the best portfolio and avoid things like um, incentives for countries to expropriate or do export controls when they've all cooperated and all have a share of the vaccine pie rather than each going it alone. So that's basically the economic modeling we've done so far. And again, we're happy to um, get comments on that and discuss it further in the discussion part. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Yvonne Orbani Maldonado. Uh, she is a Stanford University Senior Associate Dean on the Faculty in Development and Diversity at the Medical School and a Professor of Pediatrics and of Health Research. Uh, Bonnie is an expert in infectious diseases and has, and has focused on epidemiological aspects of viral vaccine development, kind of coming at the same question from a different angle. Bonnie, welcome, and please begin your presentation. Thank you so much, um, uh, Eros, and to all of the other uh, panel members as well. Um, I, um, it's an opportunity for me to talk a little bit about the work that I'm doing, um, and this is only just a small amount of the many things that are going on at the School of Medicine. I think I would urge all of you to go to the rise.stanford.edu website to see what other opportunities there are, what research opportunities are going on, not only at the medical school, but across the university. So uh, what I'd like to do really is focus just on some of the clinical and epidemiologic work that I've been doing uh, since, uh, it just seems like forever, but it's only just been for the last uh, three months or so. Um, and so Hi, Bonnie, I am so sorry to interrupt your session here, but can you please go full screen? Perfect. Thank you so much. And so um, what uh, I have been working on, again, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist. And so the work that we've been doing here has really focused on um, from very early on, meaning around February, we were approached um, to uh, try to understand what kinds of things could we do given the nature of this potential pandemic, of course it had not been declared a pandemic at that point yet. Um, and what we had, uh, what I had discussed with my colleagues was um, really a broad-based population-based approach, which is generally the kind of work that I've been doing primarily in the developing world, but also in some of the early work I did with CDC and the state health department in, in around uh, prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV. And so when we looked at this particular um, problem, what we were uh, trying to understand is what is the nature of the uh, transmission of this virus uh, from an epidemiologic perspective? How can we measure that? And one of the things we decided to do was here listed in number one, which is a household transmission study, which would aim to understand um, how this virus is transmitted in households and so uh, given that we were able to um, 
engage with a donor fairly early on, that is at the end of February, and uh, we were able to be funded the first week of March, which coincided with our ability within our Stanford lab to have one of the few non-federal um, uh, test, uh, testing sites available in the country. So our laboratory was able to set up a, a, very, uh, a very highly accurate uh, PCR test within our lab, and that was set up the first week of March. Now, we wanted to start enrolling families at that point, but unfortunately, this is a, I bring this up because it's relevant to uh, future issues around how do we control uh, epidemics and other, other non-epidemic infectious diseases is supply chain issues. We could not find swabs to do the study that we wanted to do. Um, it took us a month to actually get the study going, not because we didn't have money or resources, we just could not find swabs. So the idea of the study was to really try to compare, um, to really do household transmission studies, identifying people who would come in to our hospital with HI, with uh, sorry, with um, COVID uh, symptoms, and see if we could have them PCR tested. And everyone who was infected with PCR or with uh, COVID was approached and asked if they would participate in the study, where they would have um, they and their family members within their household. Um, have themselves self-swab for 21 days after infection. Now, remember, this was in March and April, so we didn't really know much about the virus at that point. Um, one of the other things that we were able to do during that study was to actually validate a nasal swab assay, which actually has been accepted for publication now and will be published in about a week or so, where we looked at swabbing of the anterior nares or the nostril versus swabbing of the throat. And now we're doing a back, backup study swabbing of the, um, the nasopharynx, which is a traditional gold standard swab. And we were able to show that not early on that the nasal swab is actually quite accurate. So we're uh, finishing up those trials, sorry. We're finishing up those trials to try to um, uh, get validation of that assay so that we can really uh, get nasal swabs into the hands of our clinicians in the hospital at Stanford um, Emergency Medicine and, and elsewhere in the clinics. The other issue we wanted to look at was how quickly the virus would, would uh, transmit within family members, how long people would shed the virus, and whether there were viral kinetics um, that we could identify that were important in um, in uh, patterns of transmission. And then finally, down the line, we hope to be able to harvest these viruses and then look at genomic patterns to see if there is any evidence for risk of transmission um, within these viruses. And so we're halfway through the study now, but my sense is that we're gonna keep going to work um, on, on uh, as long as we can uh, recruit patients to really understand the definition of household transmission, because as you know, we're finding out more and more about how long this virus can be shed. So the second study was one that we were engaged with through uh, a, a generous donation from Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg um, through the CZI, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the Biohub, and UCSF. And this is a, a large collaboration where we are going to enroll uh, 7,500 individuals over the course of the next um, several months, and the study is in, uh, really re, uh, is respect to um, two general populations. One is the population at large representing six counties in the Bay Area, and we are trying to really define what is the new incidence of infection in that population, as well as what is the antibody prevalence in the population in the Bay Area between now and the end of December. One of the reasons we wanna do this is to be able to understand whether there are hot spots that are turning up over time as we open up the Bay Area. And, and we've also engaged quite closely with the public health departments uh, within the Bay Area so that we can let them know if we start to find hot spots. So we are in this process of enrolling these 4,000 people uh, through UCSF, uh, Zuckerberg, San Francisco General Hospital, and Stanford. We'll be following them through nine months uh, through December or maybe longer if we, we can to look for new infections, not existing, but new infections and new antibody seroconversion to understand um, who's getting infected and uh, what the dynamics of that are so that counties can respond to those new infections. And then finally, the second study there 
um, under the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is really to look at 3,500 uh, Bay Area healthcare workers, and those would be people who came to Stanford, UCSF, and Zuckerberg, uh, San Francisco General Hospital, who were tested with symptoms, most of them with symptoms, and were found to be a COVID negative. But we want, again, to do the same thing, to identify risk of, uh, of, of in incident disease and antibody uh, seroconversion in healthcare workers in the Bay Area. And so we'll be following them as well over about six months. We're also going to be focusing very closely on those populations uh, to look at the kinetics of the antibody evolution in them. That is, when do they develop antibody after infection? Uh, do they develop antibody after infection? What's the nature of the antibody? Do they have neutralizing antibody? Is it protective against subsequent infection or exposure? Is it protective against... Um, is it protective against um, uh, infection of others? That is, will people become infected, but then uh, spread disease to others? And this is critical because this happens with other viruses. For example, polio virus uh, can be vaccinated against, and the vaccine is quite effective at present, preventing paralysis, but an individual with immunity can actually uh, become infected over and over again and spread the polio virus and infect others and cause them to be paralyzed. So we really wanna make sure we understand the kinetics of the antibody response to coronaviruses, uh, specifically to COVID-19 uh, and uh, SARS-CoV-2. And then finally, we are uh, developed a, um, a very large uh, program to try to build uh, outpatient clinical trials um, here uh, on the Stanford campus our first study is a lambda interferon trial uh, that we're conducting now at the Galvez tents uh, over by the uh, football stadium. And One then, minute. And then also uh, two other studies that are pending with these are antiviral th uh, therapies. The current trial, the lambda interferon is an immunomodulator. We're hoping to uh, get FDA approval shortly for the other two antiviral uh, uh, drugs. And we're also looking to partner both across the country and internationally with other institutions so that we can build out our portfolio of outpatient drugs. Because if we have a surge, we want to be able to have a toolkit of drugs available to treat the outpatient, which really is the place where you want to either uh, eradicate infection before it uh, gets into the general population or to prevent people who are, have mild symptoms from developing more severe symptoms which would lead to hospitalization. So um, that is really uh, the major, just a high level uh, number of trials that we're working on. We obviously have many other initiatives going on, including antibody testing, um, et cetera. And um, this is just a picture of the tent that we're working in to enroll our seroepidemiologic studies in collaboration with Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan. We have a tent right next door that's just as large where we're doing our outpatient clinical trials as well. Um, thank you so much, and I'll look forward to questions or comments later on. Thank you very much. I'm just waiting for my video to go on one moment. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, okay, we're back, and I'm here just for a second to introduce our final speaker for, of the uh, session. Our final, final speaker is Eric Horvitz. He's a technical fellow and chief scientific officer at Microsoft where he provides leadership and perspectives on scientific advances and issues at the intersection of technology, people, and society. Eric, thanks very much. If you wanna share your slides, uh, take it away, please. And go full screen. Well, thanks, Russ, and good afternoon. Um, so right before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, our team published work led by my UW PhD advisee, Daly, on the use of machine learning to build models that can predict and alert physicians hours in advance about the likelihood that a patient would require a life-saving intervention. And the work was done with a, with a focus on helping physicians to catch and plan for challenging cases of organ system failure, but it really foreshadowed the role of machine learning with responding to the pandemic. Uh, now, two areas of opportunity uh, with the use of predictive models to enhance the delivery of uh, clinical care uh, such as providing uh, guidance on whether a COVID patient should be admitted to the hospital or whether a hospitalized patient will experience a serious adverse outcome, for example, requiring a transfer to an intensive care unit. Uh, 
And, and beyond the quality of care, these models can help with freeing up hospital resources. Another pillar of activity uh, is the in the public health realm, you know, where models of risk can be used to guide the formulation of healthcare policies, uh, as well as individual decision making. Uh, I think which will grow in importance with moves to re reduce restrictions and various other approaches to opening up the economy. Now, on adverse outcomes, we're seeing a constellation of predictive models being developed by teams across the world that can predict one or more outcomes of SARS uh, coronavirus 2 infection. Um, the potential power uh, of prediction is highlighted by work done several weeks back by CMU graduate student Benjamin Lendrich, who's now working as an intern with research scientist Rich Caruana at Microsoft. And what Ben did was he examined a very large and very messy open access data source put together by a consortium of multiple organizations you see here. And the consortium pulled together a large but coarse and messy data set on COVID-19 drawn from hospitals in multiple countries. Now, Ben sifted through uh, uh, thousands of records and did the tedious work of identifying outcomes available in, sm in a fr small fraction of the, of the database of about 266,000 patients. And based on this, he built a predictive model with an interpretable machine learning procedure that performed remarkably well in being able to predict which patients would transition to ICU intubation or death. And as captured in this histogram here of patients by probability of adverse outcome, Ben noticed surprisingly high densities of groups of patients who are very likely to do well versus groups who would very likely do poorly in terms of the outcomes like going to an intensive care unit, being intubated or dying, all based on patient demographics and comorbidities. Now, although it was very messy data, uh, the model and predictive power highlighted the potential opportunity to better understand patient risk. And pushing to explore higher fidelity data sets, the Microsoft research team has been collaborating, just a fabulous group what, at what I would call one of the center at one of the centers of the storm at NYU Medicine in New York City, uh, and this is with doctors Yin Opinyanapong, Jonathan Austrian, and Leo Horitz and others. Uh, and the NYU Health team has been working on building and testing uh, uh, different kinds of models leveraging data from thousands of COVID positive patients. As an example, uh, one of the models has been built to predict that patients will not have a poor outcome for 96 hours where adverse outcomes include transfer to an ICU, intubation, a discharge to hospice care or death, and other outcomes based on patient information, including vital signs, lab values, and oxygen needs. Now, this work was undertaken to help physicians who are grappling with clinical uncertainties about patient trajectories based on vital signs and a whole set of lab results like markers of inflammation. But clearly more accurate predictions could help augment clinical decision-making. The model performs well when tested on patient data as represented by this receiver operator characteristic curve here, which captures on the y-axis true positive, true positive rate and on the x-axis false positive rates at different operating thresholds. Now, beyond formal test results, uh, when you have a, introduce a predictive model into a clinical setting, uh, there's a need for strong evaluations of, of what's the the value of making these recommendations or evaluations available to physicians in real world decision making. So it's important to run studies, in fact, to do well designed, randomized clinical trials of the value of the physician AI team. Uh, and uh, it's uh, really uh, nice to, to know that, that the, this is exactly what the NYU team is doing. They're looking to extend, uh, uh, a, to do a well designed, randomized clinical trial of the value of the physician AI team versus uh, unaided physicians. And the idea is to, to act not just work with their own hospital system, but to extend and recruit additional hospitals to help understand with randomized clinical trial with, with an AI system, how well these systems will work. Uh, and uh, this, you can, hospitals can get involved with the outreach to Yin, whose email I've listed here. Now look at performing randomized clinical trials of AI systems in, in real clinical settings resonates deeply with a theme at the Stanford Human Centered AI Institute on understanding how people and AI systems can work together. Moving out of public health, there are opportunities to leverage predictive models built via machine learning for community or countywide health programs, as well as in personal decisions. 
when moving beyond global policy, policies like shelter in place, uh, there are numerous designs and parameters involving mixes of sheltering, distancing, testing protocols, contact tracing uh, to identify those who may have been exposed to the virus, and it's being sensitive to potential disparities impact of the programs based on poor access to healthcare, health knowledge, effective shelter, and contact tracing. So it's clear that models of risk I have here in the center of the screen will serve a central role in these designs and there's an opportunity to better understand how to stratify people by their inferred risk, both in terms of cohorts or groups of people, as well as individuals, um, as we wanna understand how different sets of attributes uh, you know, lead to different levels of risk. Now, predictions of risk will be valuable in supporting public discussion, as well as in designing policies via optimization and undertaking rich decision analyses about the, the impact, costs, and benefits of alternate programs. Now, to date, high-level statistics are being communicated based on relatively coarse data from patients coming to the hospital. For example, uh, on a community scale, uh, here's a map put together by a collaboration by Microsoft and the Dartmouth Atlas of the population of population densities of people at high risk in different what are called hospital service areas, where high risk is defined for different regions as the density of Medicare beneficiaries over age 65 and with at least two of a set of chronic conditions drawn from regional data. One minute. Uh, we can do better, and there's opportunity for harnessing machine learning to help people across the world answer questions like. What is the risk if I become COVID positive? And, um, and what is the risk if I engage in a specific activity? Now, just last Friday, um, uh, in, a, in a piece in the New England Journal of Medicine, Dr. Mark Larachelle sought to provide physicians with guidance based on core statistical data and the risks of particular activities, stating, as states move to reopen their economies, physicians should engage patients in individualized risk assessments. And he offered a matrix of advice uh, with cells representing recommendations to patients at different levels of risk of outcomes given different activities. So, you know, what should the physician be telling patients about what they should be doing given a policy? Now, a promising opportunity moving forward is to pursue data and approximation strategies for predicting the probability that individuals will suffer an adverse outcome should they become infected, or using the causal notation of Udaya Pearl, a do COVID plus, plus action. Uh, set me to COVID plus, what's my risk? And this differs from models of adverse outcomes to date, which predict poor outcomes based on data made available via people who have qualifying levels of an illness, who have sought and have been able to gain access to testing. The data available is changing as testing becomes more widely available, uh, and as hospitals begin testing all incoming patients, so-called incidental COVID positive, even if people don't have symptomatology. So there's a great opportunity in harnessing machine learning to help uh, with clinical and community decisions uh, for better understanding risks and trade-off. Uh, and areas of work here include doing cl clinical trials to understand the value of predictive models to augment physician decision-making and in developing more precise uh, and you might say relevant models of personal and community risk. And I'll stop there. Okay, this is Russ, thank you very much. I need to be enabled to start my video, please. And then I will, thank you very much. Great, uh, and that was our three speakers, uh, excellent. We have, uh, we wanna remind you to ask your questions on the ask questions part of the site. I'm inviting all the panelists back, uh, Susan, Bonnie, and Eric, my, uh, my co-host Rob, we're all here. Uh, and there's a question that I actually wanna start out from the audience because I think it's very important. One of the audience members asks, is a vaccine absolutely necessary to get out of this pandemic? And they then quoted some statistics about death rates and about compli potential complication rates of a vaccine. And I'm wondering both for Susan, Bonnie and Eric, um, is this a mandatory part of our strategy or is it possible that a vaccine won't be an important component of the response? Well, let me take that one first. So um, we know that with HIV, for example, we have no vaccine and we do have prospects for control of the disease 
But ultimately, if you really want to eradicate an illness, um, the, a vaccine route would probably be the best way to go. Susan? I'd just say on top of that, we really need um, all shots on goal here. Uh, so, you know, we it, it's possible that we could come up with a great therapeutic that people could get early enough um, that, you know, they're they they wouldn't suffer all of the different um, you know risks and and poor health outcomes and that people wouldn't be afraid. But you know to to think about that to make that work you would need to have lots and lots of testing because to try to catch this thing early you would need to know early that you had it and we're not there yet either. Um, and then you know it's a it's lots of drugs have side effects so they don't work for different people. So the idea that you know we we're going to be able to just get at this with with therapeutics and diagnostics seems um, unlikely to me as as well. However, that doesn't mean that we should slow down on our investments in diagnostics and therapeutics. Um, and at, we actually are seeing, despite the fact that everybody seems to understand how important these things are, we're seeing underinvestment and lack of coordination and implementation. You know, still today in all three of those areas. Thank you, um, Eric. Yeah, my reaction is we're all waiting, uh, you know, for uh, a vaccine, uh, and uh, have our, we have high hopes. In the meantime, coming up with great therapeutics to uh, to reduce some of the deaths uh, would be fabulous. Uh, it's great to see at least some of the molecular dynamics and and uh, design efforts focused on therapeutics, the therapeutic uh, uh, set of courses, uh, and uh, for mitigation of the, the the worst parts of the illness. Um, I love uh, Susan Athey's uh, metaphor as a hockey player myself, all shots on goal. So Bonnie, another question that comes up, especially in your work, uh, especially for your first two projects, I, I just wonder, is the ramp up of testing, both for active disease and serology, is that meeting your needs uh, or do you see that as a critical rate limiting step to your ability to get answers to the questions, the community-based questions that you're asking? Yeah, so do you mean, do we really need to go out into the population and... No, do you have the supplies? Like, is, are the tests there? Are the serologies in place? Uh, yes, we do now. I mean, obviously it's been, uh, you know, we have been cashing in every chip we can find. Um, but we have a pretty, a, a pretty good supply now. With, we've been uh, shoring up suppliers from different parts of the world. We've been leveraging with the hospital. Um, we do now have, by the way, 3D printed swabs that are being felt that just got validated an EUA approval from the FDA. So um, uh, the, um, the laboratory kits, you know, we have multiple platforms. So it's not just one platform now, there are at least four platforms that we have. So I think we just have to leverage all of those pieces in order to do the testing. That's not just true for us, that'll be true around the, the world. Really. Important news. Thanks. Let me throw it to Rob, who I know has some questions. Yeah, I, I, I got a question also from the audience that I think, um, you know, it, it's a it's a sign of our forward looking orientation here that we're thinking about prospects for a vaccine, how it is that AI and other technological approaches could accelerate the, the production or discovery of one. Um, um, I think an important question, um, just perhaps a factual matter is uh, essential here to put on the table, which is, who is the body responsible for deciding which populations of people receive vaccines if and when they're available? So what can we expect on the delivery mechanism? And then just to tie this session to the last session, if you think about, if, if you were listening to the previous session with Danielle Allen, Nate Persily, and Marie Shashaka, um, identifying a kind of social crisis that was happening at the same time as a public health one, um, we know, for example, that even if we rapidly develop a vaccine in the United States, there's a population of people who are resistant to taking it, even if it's available. Um, there are people who resist um, downloading an app for contact tracing because they have suspicions about who might use that data. So in the spirit of thinking technologically, what's the problem we're trying to solve? What's the objective function here? If we so only me, concern ourselves with so, vaccine development and treatment, but we can't get people to actually adopt them, um, we don't yet have a solution. So I'm actually uh, uh, the liaison to the federal government. I'm, I'm the chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Infectious Disease. We make vaccine policy for 67,000 pediatricians around the country and actually many other countries follow our lead. 
Uh, I'm also the, the uh, liaison to the federal government's vaccine um, uh, 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 approval pr uh, committee, the ACIP. And um, one of the issues that we are facing, and I'm also, we just started a Lancet commission on and on vaccine acceptance. So we used to call it vaccine uh, uh, hesitancy. Then we called it vaccine confidence and now we're calling it vaccine acceptance. Mm -hmm. uh, we are seeing a remarkable overlay of groups that are coming together in very interesting ways. And as you know, there's already a push to prevent, uh, to spread news about the harmfulness of vaccines before one has even been developed. So we know that there are some background work going on and there's quite a bit of work done on who's funding those groups and how they're coming together. But the point is that hesitancy or acceptance, whatever you wanna call it, is going to be a major factor. Um, again, trust and communication are really big areas of interest. We're trying to explore those areas in our colleagues at the School of Education and others can really try to help us with that. Regarding who's going to do this and who's going to, I mean, I'll listen to my colleagues as well, but I have a lot of experience with these um, programs. And the big problem we're facing is there's really no one head of, and you know, no one person to tell us what to do, as you can imagine. So the World Health Organization, which I, I don't know if officially we're not part of it anymore or where we are there, but uh, uh, WHO generally has lots of regulatory, they have a lot of technical clout. They have, countries really respond to, ex except for, for the few exceptions, tech countries generally respond to what the WHO says. These are the experts. Most of them actually are trained by us in the US and they really do have the expertise and the technical capacity to make, re um, make recommendations, but they are recommendations nonetheless. In the United States, this is exactly the problem. I don't know what you talked about before. Unfortunately, I had other uh, commitments, but uh, okay. the problem we are facing in this country among many is that we are extremely decentralized about our approach. And that is going to affect what happens with this vaccine. That said, the ACIP or the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which is part of the US Public Health Service, does make vaccine policy for this country but they are recommendations. The states make guidelines for school entry. So that's how it's broken down. Thank you. So, so maybe I could just pop in on the world stage. It's it, it's actually pretty tricky to figure all of this out. And there's a lot of, a lot of discussions going on right now. And still, um, I would say some lack of clarity about who's leading which efforts. Um, we're not seeing, you know, a single country taking leadership over this. There are organizations uh, like Gavi and Seppi that have existed for a long time and have a lot of background in terms of trying to get vaccines to the developing world. Um, but even there, um, there's it's 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 unclear exactly what the right answers are. There's epi epidemiological issues, and you know, we don't know yet who is actually most important in terms of transmission. We certainly want to think about healthcare workers, frontline workers, people who are out there interacting in service roles with the population, and we know who are high risk. But also some of the people who are high risk, the elderly may also be higher risk for side effects from vaccines. Um, and so trying to figure out that policy is, I think, an ongoing international discussion. And then also who gets it among different countries and right. how do we make sure that the countries that have the money have sufficient incentives to fork up, fork up the money and contribute while ensuring that the world is covered. Because of course, if we have outbreaks popping up one place, they're just going to feed right back into the rest of the world. So even from a self-interested perspective on the developing world, they, everybody needs to care about what's happening globally. Yeah, so if I could just offer a gloss before you comment, Eric, on, on something you just said, Susan, I wanna check that what I'm about to say is right. Um, the cost benefit analysis that you provided us in your opening slides about just how massively beneficial it would be to accelerate even by a small number of months, the availability of a vaccine, doesn't yet answer questions about the public health guidance that we need on which po populations should receive it, the elderly, our frontline healthcare workers, nor the political questions about whether or not which countries contribute um, funds for the development of the vaccine might have political claim on it for their own citizens prior to others. And so those are further problems for us to identify and address, it sounds like. 
Exactly. It's you, I mean, you can have a sort of idealistic vision about, you know, everyone getting it at the same time, but the facts remain that some countries have more capacity in their countries than others. And some countries have more money than others. And so trying to align everyone's interests is, is somewhat challenging. However, the, 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 the optimistic note is that it's actually in the benefit of many, many countries, even down to the middle of the income distribution to make some investments in this. And um, we believe that it's possible to have an incentive compatible uh, type of program where, although it does require that the people who are putting in the most money get some priority for their for their own citizens, you need to have a, a benefit to, for the investment. Thanks. So Susan, just following up on that, there's been some questions about uh, who, whose hundred billion dollars were you spending in those uh, in those simulations? And I think you're kind of implying the answer, but could you just say what's the uh, idea about where that comes from, and does it matter if it's ten times ten billion, or does it have to be one times a hundred from a single country? Or yeah, no, we've looked at a bunch of different scenarios. So if you think about each country going it alone, you can still get a lot of social benefits because it's in the individual interest of a lot of countries to do that. Some of the concerns you worry about is that people invest too much in the same candidates, um, also that you create supply chain bottlenecks and get insufficient diversification. And you also worry that if countries, if if countries are every doing everything completely independently, then people may not want, may not trust an investment they make because they're worried that the companies won't be able to follow through due to export controls or supply chain bottlenecks that are created when other countries try to get in on the game. So having some kind of contractual framework that everyone agrees to about respecting contracts, understanding that you have to make some commitments if you want people to make big investments. So those are some of the challenges that you have. And of course, again, we do want to be both fair and equitable and also just from a self-interested perspective, make sure that that we don't, we don't have hoarding in rich countries and less in poor countries. Yeah. The good news is though, the rich countries just don't have that many people who want the vaccine. Um, and if we invest in enough capacity, then you know we'll get to the people who don't want to take it in the U.S. And as long as we don't hoard that, hoping they're going to change their minds, we can we can start vaccinating other people while we're in process of convincing more people to take it here. Yeah, we just make a comment here that. Um, Given what we currently know about uh, racial disparities in rates of chronic medical conditions that couple with levels of education, healthcare access, distrust, and the data that shows that uh, there's an overrepresentation of Blacks and Latinos uh, in deaths, recent New York City data was quite striking, in fact, that we need to be extremely sensitive when there's a rollout, uh, especially under bounded resources to do special efforts to address uh, vaccinations of those communities. Well, and then in addition, I think you mentioned Gavi, but unfortunately Gavi really only deals with, well, first of all, CEPI hasn't been around only about three or four years. So they're just starting off and they're really focused on pandemic platforms. Um, they don't really have a governance structure really per se. And Gavi is really de dealing with the bottom tier countries. So if anybody has an advocate, it would be those bottom tier countries, it's about 70 plus so countries. Um, so there would be some negotiation at the table, I imagine where that they would come into play and they can actually, they, they can try to scale for the countries that they represent. So, so there are some, there is some precedent. I think the uh, pandemic flu of 2009, we saw some of this happen then. In fact, Indonesia at that time uh, really felt that they were uh, left out of out in the cold, if you will, because um, they uh, were working quite a bit with some of the um, with the strains and were not at the they weren't at the front of the line. And so after that, there was some mistrust around who's going to be. You know, so there's more more recognition that everybody needs to have a seat at the table. What that where that table is and who who sits at the head of the table is really the problem. I want to switch a little bit to uh, Eric. You showed some AI models for machine learning and. Um, uh, and we're talking about fairness and disparities in the last couple of minutes. And as you know very well, one of the issues that comes up when you train on data that may have been affected by differential access to care, differential outcomes, there's a worry about those models being prematurely introduced and leading to increased disparities. I'm wondering what you think are the prospects for making sure that in the COVID case, we try to make sure that these are uh, 
uh, as good as possible and as fair as possible. Yeah, what a great comment, Russ. Um, it's, uh, I often say that it's, it's great that this virus and pandemic hit not any sooner than now, given the, the, the rate of advancement in biomedical informatics, machine learning, uh, uh, molecular design and understanding, but also uh, really great efforts on uh, fairness in machine learning uh, with the whole community around it. So I think it is a challenge. Um, we, we do need to, to begin uh, uh, looking very carefully at those models, not just from an acute, we get this model up and running and let's clinically evaluate it uh, in terms of its efficacy in working with physicians. We need to also understand whether there are some systematic biases. Now you might say that unfortunately some of the systematic biases right now uh, might be even aimed at the overrepresented populations of folks who are actually dying, uh, uh, in, you know, around the country. Uh, uh, again, the the you know, 92 uh, out of 100,000, um, uh, 74 out of 100,000 um, versus 45 out of 100,000 deaths uh, in New York City. Recent studies showed. So you know. I don't think, I'd like to say it's good news that the systems are biased in that way right now, potentially for the, for the data, but I think that in general, we have to deal more, more globally with the biases. In particular, as I mentioned during my, my eight minutes, the biases the fa of, of how the data is being uh, collected and tested based on access to tests. And that could, you know, given this probably reduced access to the, um, uh, to the, to the racial minorities, it would probably lead to another source of bias in the other direction. So thanks. Can I jump in on that? I think yes. one of the one of the things that's important in trying to solve these problems and have better machine learning, more reliable machine learning, is having access to more data. And actually, one of the things that I, that I've personally encountered in this crisis is how challenging it is to actually get data. So Eric had sort of a success story, but in general, trying to get patient level data that allows you to understand the the full background of a patient, what drugs they've been taking, what their comorbidities are, and so on, has been very difficult. Um, health claims data comes available after claims are filed. So in the March, April timeframe, when all the people are coming to the hospital, um, some of the data sources that we often use in medical research that that are broader and bigger were not were just not available yet. So then the data about the patients coming into the hospitals is actually sitting in hospital systems. Well, that's incredibly fragmented. They all have their separate EMR systems. In addition to that, they, there's of course patient privacy that needs to be protected, um, IRBs that need to be gone through, and coordinating PIs. So I was part of a team at Johns, at Johns Hopkins in Stanford where we've been looking at a particular therapeutic and we spent a lot of time going all over the world and all over the US, going from hospital system to hospital system, trying to find collaborators and get access to data so that we could run models, potentially pooling data across while preserving patient privacy um, to look at whether, for example, drugs that people were already on when they came into the hospital made things worse or better for them uh, when they came in to be, to, to be treated for COVID. Well, and the, da the data that. problems, the data problems were just, you know, enormous. And so in terms of like pandemic preparedness, at least for the next pandemic, you know, we need to, we need to be able to react. Like it was just insane to me that, you know, no one in the entire U.S. had a view on all of the data for these patients coming in. So we ended up collaborating with the VA, which has a very big system, and we're working on some analysis now from that system. And some countries you know, have, have systems where they had a real-time view. But that limitation of without the data, you can't, do, you can't do any machine learning, let alone high quality machine learning that accounts for fairness and other issues. So I, I just think it's a huge policy issue that you know, we, need to, we need to solve now, but also for the future. Well, Bonnie, I'm, I'm going to give you the last word. Yeah, I'd like to add to that issue. Um, I think some of the data, again, the data that you get is the data you don't know. Uh, there, are, as an epidemiologist and a lab-based molecular epi person, I would say that I worry about some of the data that is being collected because it is it's going to be biased. It, there's no question. I mean, we can't have perfect data, but the people coming into the hospital, especially if you look at disparities. Uh, may not be the people uh, who are at the bottom of the pyramid. That is, we don't know what's going on with the people who aren't coming in, who are not sick enough to come into the hospital. What's the real spectrum of this disease? Um, you can't just look at that piece of it and say that this is predictive of 
of a lot. This is predictive of who comes into the hospital, basically, is what you're Well, and the, yeah, and the testing, too. The testing was very, like, across the VA system, the testing was very different as well. The second thing I'd like to say, please, is that um, the other issue that we're forgetting uh, altogether here is the genomic aspects. We don't understand yet the precision medicine aspects and what's going on with the genomic significance either of the virus or more importantly of the patient. So we don't know whether there are host characteristics that are skewing the responses. And there's some indication that that may be appropriate. We are trying to get that data now. We've certainly been working with the Biohub and here at Stanford as well to look at those aspects. It is, are there, are there issues around the host? And, and uh, when you look at, especially at racial and health disparities, we know that in pharmacogenomics you find this and it may be possible that this is happening as well. So I do think that these large data set um, approaches are gonna be critical, but we also need to keep in mind that there may be some pieces that we're missing, much like you already pointed out. So um, as, as, as much as we can open up those data sets and, and even start to, to delve into unexplored areas where sets, data sets are not being kept would be really helpful. Well. With that, I want to end the session. I want to thank Eric, Susan, Bonnie for your insights. Uh, we, uh, we are clearly still in process, uh, but we re very much appreciate your insights. Uh, I'd like to join, uh, ask Rob to join back. I'd like to ask our panelists to turn off their video as we do a quick wrap up of what was a uh, quite striking day, I think, Rob. You, uh, your thoughts? Yeah, indeed. Well. You know, we held our first version of this on April 1st, um, now a second version, June 1st. The idea that uh, HAI might hold another one of these in two or three months, possibly also once again in an entirely online format, um, seems to me possibly inevitable, but also um, dispiriting. Um, it, it, it awakens us to just how enduring this crisis is likely to be. And you know, what I have in mind just by way of, a, you know, a kind of brief attempt at summary or synthesis of what we've heard today is that, you know, we organized this entire half day to look at the economic path forward, the social path forward, and the medical path forward. And one of the things which I, I, I want to insist upon noting, because I think it's an underappreciated aspect um, um, about this, and it's something that, that we can point to that's hopeful, um, the, the, the people who joined us today as experts to talk about this are just a small fraction of the number of scholars and other leaders who have completely redirected their, their own professional research agendas in order to confront and address the crisis head on. Um, it means that we have extraordinary amounts of talent trying to work on the problem. And it, the conversation today makes me think that we, we, we have to, um, first appreciate the scale of the problem before we might imagine um, viable solutions to it, not just a medical question. Yes, we want technology, AI, machine learning to accelerate a path toward a vaccine or to help us identify clinical protocols that will enable better outcomes, but we also have a social crisis, an economic crisis, and, and, a, and more than anything else, as Danielle Allen, I think, rightly put her finger on, um, a crisis about the social contract that binds us all together and worries about whether or not trusted institutions, independent of expertise, independent of solutions on particular fronts, will allow people actually to adopt solutions if and when they're available. So we're in this for the long run. Um, we might have some uh, improvements uh, uh, in the public health dimension of the crisis in the near future. Um, but the social dimensions of everything are going to take a long time for us to crawl out of. And this is an all hands on deck moment um, to crawl out of this and to rebuild and reestablish trust in our social institutions will require, you know, the work of years, not the work of months. I, I agree. And thank you for putting uh, putting it so well. I'll just add that, um, the, you know, you might not have heard about a ton of AI today, but uh, as those of us who are working on AI try to anticipate solutions to the problems in society, it's precisely this 360 degree view of all the ways in which technology can impact the society that will lead to uh, deployments of AI that are helpful, positive, and useful, and not negative. And so, we don't really apologize about the fact that AI is a little bit in the background today, because that's the point. AI should be in service of these bigger challenges that uh, you just heard nine uh, amazing uh, scholars and workers talking about. 
So I think that if you're okay, Rob, we will call this a conference. Yeah, and just a reminder to everyone watching that uh, all of these videos and this, the entirety of, of it will be available on YouTube later today, possibly in, in just a very short amount of time, and that individual sessions will also be available on the HAI YouTube channel in a matter of days. If you're on the HAI mailing list or registered for this event, you are will receive that link very soon. Uh, you will also receive a survey. We want to know if these are affected, if they're hitting the mark or if they're missing the mark. So your opinions are quite important. Important. Thank you again for making the time to hear about this important research today. All of us at HAI care very deeply about the global pandemic and wanted to bring our expertise and our network to you as a public service. We hope you found it useful, thankful. Thank you. And until next time, stay safe.